the, the Euro CPR community gathering at SEPS, which is a, you know, it's a rather new, new thing. It's an idea that came out uh, last year to bring Euro CPR to Brussels. Uh, and uh, for me, as a, a member of the board since many years, uh, it was a natural, uh, uh, a natural uh, say, uh, a solution to, to offer SEPS facilities, which we use on a daily basis to host conferences, uh, roundtables, uh, and uh, working parties and many other initiatives also related to the telecoms industry uh, to host a conference that I think has always uh, reserved us some, uh, some good insights and good hints on where the telecom industry is going and where, more broadly, the e-communications industry is going. Um, we kickstart this session. I just uh, offer, uh, offer just a few remarks. Uh, uh, I don't want to start already behind schedule, so I will keep it at, at a minimum, and then we, uh, we, uh, I'll catch up later on with some comments on the presentations that will be offered. Uh, just uh, as a minor remark, uh, we just uh, are uh, uh, out of another uh, initiative that we had yesterday at SEPS, which was a roundtable on, uh, there was a very interesting roundtable on media pluralism and freedom of expression in the Internet age. Uh, so we already, uh, some of us are already warmed up. I see Rohan Samarajiva, for example, Peggy, uh, they were involved in this uh, already yesterday. We've been warming up. Uh, we had a very interesting keynote speech by uh, Sana Salem, who is a blogger uh, the, who was connecting remotely from Karachi, Pakistan, where she has uh, built a dedicated uh, say NGO that works on freedom of expression, and she deals in particular with internet filtering issues. And it was a very interesting experience because then we uh, presented a number of reports that have been uh, recently drafted uh, uh, more or less in the Brussels uh, area uh, um, uh, for the European Commission, for the European Parliament on uh, whether media policy and whether freedom of expression and media pluralism should be subject to refined uh, rules and uh, reform rules in new policies at the EU level. Um, so some of us are already in the mood and we keep the whole community in the mood by uh, offering you, I think, what is uh, going to be a very interesting program. You have it with you. Um, I'm going to uh, deal with the, uh, with the opening session. I will see that there are international sessions and session more related to the digital agenda uh, throughout these two days. Uh, it is a strange moment. That's my impression for the digital agenda, uh, meaning that we are uh, at the end of, uh, yeah, strange. I, didn't say, I haven't said negative because otherwise Megan uh, immediately <laughs> jumps on the chair. Uh, we are, I think, at the end of the first wave of uh, 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 reforms and policies. So we are waiting for uh, something, things that will happen uh, in a few months. Uh, the reform of the list of relevant, or well, the review of the recommendations on relevant markets. Uh, later on, the review of the pack of the telecoms package. Uh, we have uh, uh, new uh, uh, announcements uh, about uh, initiatives to uh, reduce and abate the cost of NGN deployment throughout Europe. We are perhaps uh, uh, we have witnessed a little bit of a, of a um, say rather rather I wouldn't say a defeat but a disappointing outcome in budget negotiations for what concerns the connecting Europe facility. So the, the, the budget allocated to strengthening the infrastructure endowment in Europe in the areas where it's not economically feasible to deploy those infrastructures. So many of these things together, I, don't, I wouldn't say they, they, they portray gloomy uh, a forecast for the digital agenda, but certainly uh, new avenues are being found and new, and new uh, ideas, I think, have to be put on the table at this stage to accelerate what is uh, an ambitious set of, uh, of goals. So this is why EuroCPR is there for this. It's an academic community. Um, it, it has a policy relevance. It has always had policy relevance. But it's also a, a, an, a, an informal environment where people can freely think outside the box. And this is, this is why I think since the, the Seville uh, uh, years, it's always been something that uh, those that participate uh, like in particular and perhaps consider to be different from many other conferences that would otherwise appear similar. And this is why I think many of us like, uh, like the EuroCPR. Now, it's also important to talk policy at the very beginning and to, and to, and to uh, also reflect on what, uh, uh, what are the challenges that, we, that even academics and, and industry players have to cope with and help uh, policymakers address uh, in, the, in the months to come. So that's why I think in this opening session uh, we have... Um, ample opportunities to hear what is going on at policy level and to start our reflection. Don't be shy just because it's the opening session. 
you, see, you uh, will be given ample opportunities to, to ask questions and to, and to uh, warm up, heat up the debate. Huh? So please don't hesitate to do this, but not immediately with Megan, because otherwise I would just want to throw all the questions on you. Um, but definitely I would start with, uh, with uh, Megan Richards. Megan, we've met several times. We've met also and in particular with issues related to the IGF and Internet Governance. I don't know what you will uh, touch upon in your, um, if you, your will, yours will be a more general keynote on where we are or, or will be referring it. Uh, we take your surprises, so we know, we know concerns. So I'm very happy to give you the floor and I thank you very very much for being here with us at SEPS and at your CPR. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just, I have a technical problem. I'm a lawyer, so I don't know how to work any of these machines. Nobody's perfect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Do, do you want me to stand there? Is there somewhere to push the button? Oh, no, there should be a keyboard. Uh, it, there was a keyboard, actually, before that. I'll go, Maria, can you, can you go get it? Because uh, there should be a keyboard with which, you, a wireless keyboard, with which you can actually it's really fast. move slides. Do you want yeah? me to stand up there? No, no, no. But I can stand up. I no, no, if you, I if you want I'm to stand here, so Megan, it's can. wireless. Huh? Otherwise, I can. I, I the keyboard is wireless, so it depends on where you want to be. So. Okay. What do I what do? I push this button. Yeah. Oh, this one. Okay. Try this but, on. Well, that, okay. that first slide is a Work. trick. It's just to remind me where I am and, and what you're doing. So, um, well, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here. You probably can't hear me now. Um, uh, and it's not often that I get a chance to speak to an entirely academic audience. Well, I, I think you're not entirely academic, but primarily academic audience. Um, I'm the director of something called Coordination in Directorate General uh, Connect in the European Commission. And this is something that is everything and nothing. Of course, you know what coordination is. Uh, but what we cover is the digital agenda and the policy issues relating to the digital agenda, all the issues relating to innovation and research programs that the European Commission is running in the ICT area, and of course, all the economic and statistical data uh, that underpins the policy developments and the issues that we're looking at in the digital agenda. So one of the things I wanted to draw your attention to is the Digital Agenda Scoreboard, of which many of you, I think, are aware. And uh, before I go into my main spiel, as it were, I wanted to tell you that the next edition will be out about the time of the Digital Agenda Assembly this year, which this year will be under the Irish Presidency and hence in Dublin. So the Digital Agenda Scoreboard with the updated figures and updated information based on the uh, key indicators will be available then. So that's something that's of interest to you, I'm sure. So let me just start a little bit by not going into details about the digital agenda, which I'm sure you know what it is, at least the digital agenda for Europe, but where we are now. And because this um, conference was called In Search of Evidence, Issues and Trends, I thought I would try to identify some of the areas where we think there is particular interest in further study, further work. A lot of work is uh, going on now. Uh, many of you have seen the information and the reports from the OECD on the digital economy. Uh, you know that we have uh, asked the Joint Research Center of the European Commission to prepare a study also on the importance of the digital economy. There are many, many um, studies going on, uh, Boston Consulting, uh, the McKinsey study, etc., on showing how important uh, ICT is for the economy. So my very short message to you is that the trends are up and the issues are important. Uh, and I'm sure over the course of today and tomorrow you will be discussing and going into the exact details of where and how and what, uh, I, which I'm not going to speak to you about. So what I thought I would do was uh, try to identify a little bit some of the issues that we see as particularly important, particularly in the context of what we call the review of the digital agenda. The digital agenda was adopted in May 2010 when Nelly Cruz came to this uh, portfolio. And then uh, last year on the 18th of December, she wanted to review where we were with the digital agenda. It had 101 actions. Now, many of those actions are things like the commission will make a proposal for. That doesn't really mean necessarily that something has happened. I'm not supposed to say that, but I'm sure there's no one in the Commission here <laughs> except me. What it means is that the Commission is making a proposal for a legislative 
document. That means it still has to go through legislative procedures, etc. So uh, I will talk about that very briefly because that's not so interesting for you. But I think what is important here and what we want to address, and I'm sure you will address over the next days, is the importance of uh, productivity growth uh, that derives from investment in ICT. The information and data shows that internet traffic is doubling every two to three years, and mobile internet traffic every year, doubling in other words, every year. And by 2015, it's estimated there will be 25 billion wirelessly connected devices globally, and up to 50 billion by 2020. Mobile data traffic will increase 12-fold between 2012 and 2018, and data traffic on smartphones will increase 14 times by 2018. These are predictions, of course, but we see that this is a very rapidly uh, moving area. And there are more than 4 million ICT workers in many sectors in Europe, and their number is growing 3% annually, despite the crisis. And I will talk a little bit more about the problem with skills in ICT. So we see that the internet and ICT is an area of high productivity, high growth, high interconnection, uh, enabling social uh, interaction between people, but also enabling the economy. And I think that's why the digital economy is so important and why the digital agenda for Europe is so important. So as I said, what Nelly Cruz wanted to do in reviewing the digital agenda doesn't work. Uh, so it doesn't, excuse me. Well, you have to be patient. Does it go back? No. Maybe I'm pushing the wrong button. Sorry. You should never get a lawyer to speak at these technical conferences. Get someone who knows what they're doing. That's one I that's the one I did but it's going forward. You can use the arrows. Oh that's the right one. This is the one. So in terms of global digital performance, uh, the EU does very well in certain areas. But overall, we tend to say that it's, it's trailing other countries, as, as you know very well. Uh, in particular, it does very well in categories such as environmental sustainability and social inclusion. No surprise to, to you, I'm sure. But not so well in innovation, employment, education, and training. And this just gives an overview uh, from our last digital scoreboard of where we are on what we call the seven different pillars of the digital agenda, which address, as you can see, um, enterprise environment, digital agenda, uh, issues at, in particular, innovation, education and training, labor market, social inclusion, and um, read it, uh, environmental sustainability. And this comes from the World Economic Forum's assessment of the 2020 uh, projections for growth in this area. There we are. Okay, now we're moving properly. So, I've said already a little bit about uh, the internet economy and the digital economy. How does ICT contribute to jobs and growth? I'm sure most of you know these details and, and some of this information. Probably you have different data, as everyone seems to have a different assessment of some of these things. But it's absolutely clear that the contribution to jobs and growth is essential. And the Europe 2020 strategy of the European Commission is exactly that, on jobs and growth and competitiveness. How to bring Europe back to a more competitive uh, economy, how to develop and, and encourage and further jobs and growth in Europe. Um, you can see just some of the information here that the internet uh, accounts for 21% of GDP, GDP, accounted for 21% of the G20 GDP growth from 20, 2005 to 2010. Uh, digitalized SMEs are estimated to produce 10% more, grow and export twice as much as other SMEs and create twice as many jobs as other SMEs. Uh, the impact of the cloud, of course, is extremely important, particularly for SMEs who can have access to vast amounts of uh, software, infrastructure, platforms that they couldn't otherwise afford to invest in, to maintain, or use. Uh, it's really a service that they can buy, like electricity or power. So this has great potential also for their growth uh, either in terms of sales or development of new products. And it's estimated that ICT as a whole 
contributes to about 10.5% of the EU GDP. Now that depends on how you look at it, of course. But other figures say 5%, but it depends on how you assess and, and accumulate all these data. And as I said earlier, ICT investment is assessed to contribute up to 50% of productivity growth. And then there's some other information which I've already mentioned on the number of workers, the number of use, the dramatic changes and increases in the use of ICT. Hence, of course, the importance of the digital agenda for Europe and for developing the Europe 2020 strategy. So the digital agenda was adopted in 2010, May 2010. The review took place at the end of December last year. And in that period, two and a half years, which is half of a commissioner's usual political life, approximately, even though the rest of us live longer, politicians only li live during their <laughs> terms in office. Uh, this is just an overview of the areas in which the digital agenda uh, made progress. Uh, of the 101 actions that were identified, about 50% were completed. Now, as I said, that doesn't mean that everything is fine. There's still a lot more work to do. As I said, if the Commission adopts a proposal, there's still a lot more to be done. Many of the actions also involve not just the Commission, of course, but stakeholders, member states, etc. And this is always a bit tricky to get everyone moving and, and uh, committing uh, entirely. But I think progress is certainly being made. So this was and another important message that I want to say, but that doesn't mean that everything is perfect. And in this uh, review that took place at the end of last year, there were a number of ways to, uh, that were identified to refocus and revamp and re-push the digital agenda to make sure that it would drive European growth digitally and make, uh, give an extra boost to it. And what were those? Those were seven different uh, main actions, if you like, to further the digital single market. That's not something new. The digital single market was always one of the priorities, but to give an even better boost. You will have seen probably that at the European Council last week, the Council conclusions clearly said that more has to be done to ensure that the digital single market is achieved by 2015, and that the Commission has to come up now with some actions on doing this. The Commission always has to find these solutions. Um, speeding up public sector innovation is another area that was focused on, and this is particularly important, I think, because it's also reflected in the annual growth survey. So those of you who follow um, the, the, the growth of uh, member states and economic uh, uh, developments will know that in the annual growth survey for last year, improving public sector innovation was one of the areas identified for uh, development and, and further reform in the member states. So this is an area where, of course, um, introducing e-government services has all sorts of potential impact, both on the economy but also on public welfare, consumer welfare. Little old ladies like me don't have to walk or drive or bicycle or however they get to the tax office. They can send in their tax uh, um, receipts or, or uh, claims online. And the same for e-health or telemedicine, etc. Very fast internet supply and demand. Again, an area where we have already identified this as being very important, but we really need to do more. And unfortunately, as you can expect, one of the areas there that was considered to be important was, of course, the Connecting Europe facility for broadband infrastructure rollout, which, of course, Council on 7th and 8th of February said fine for digital, so, well, they didn't say exactly what, but they said instead of 9.2 billion, make it 1 billion, which doesn't mean you can do very much in terms of rollout. So we'll have to find other ways and means of doing that, but we can discuss that later. Cloud computing I've already mentioned. Trust and security is, of course, a very important area because, as you know very well, if your computer system doesn't work or you can't have access to the Internet or you are concerned about fraud or espionage on the internet, you're not going to use it. So making sure citizens and businesses can use ICTs in a trustworthy and secure environment is absolutely essential. Of course, entrepreneurship and digital jobs and skills is another area where we have been working on and we have uh, a grand coalition <coughs> on digital skills and jobs which was launched on the 4th and 5th of March, 
with a very big uh, political presence uh, from uh, President Barroso. Four commissioners were there. And this involved industry and uh, employment sectors, member states, uh, uh, academics, uh, teachers, and, and others. So it really is to try to pull forward a bit this, this area and to try to develop further entrepreneurship through the internet. We see that web entrepreneurs, for example, need almost no uh, initial funding to get started. They just need a kid and an internet access, which can even be in an internet cafe. And they can start off with all sorts of new ideas and, and develop very quickly. It's more or less how the Angry Birds people started, as an example. And of course, beyond research and development and innovation, to further the industrial agenda for key enabling technologies. So those are the areas that were refocused on and reassessed. Cloud computing, I've mentioned it was already in the digital agenda for Europe, but you had to look pretty hard to find it. It was the third indent of Action 53. Now more focus is put there. So the digital single market and a borderless EU economy, of course, is essential to driving forward growth. Uh, we know that uh, there is a lot of progress in the single market for goods and to a more limited extent for services, but the digital single market really suffers from this fragmented uh, system. So we have to really move forward on that, and a number of uh, actions are being taken. As I said, the European Council identified this as a priority for their October Council. They want to have a digital European Council and address a whole series of issues relating to the digital single market. So we hope that that will make progress. Public sector innovation I've mentioned briefly, and I don't want to go into too much uh, detail about this because I think this is pretty obvious to, to most of you. Those are just some figures on the impact uh, and s potential savings of rolling out better and faster I innovation in the public sector. <coughs> Excuse me. This relates to the supply and demand of uh, broadband, of course, which is also a drive for competitiveness. And it's estimated sometimes that a 10% increase in broadband penetration rate results in a 1 to 1.5 increase in annual GDP per capita. So faster broadband is clearly a way of driving faster and higher GDP growth. Now, one of the issues that's always addressed here is, well, it's the chicken and egg problem, isn't it? Which comes first, the supply or the demand? And um, often people say, why should I roll out broadband? I have no demand for it. And it's, it's trite, but I, I always use the Steve Jobs quote, which is, you don't know what you need until you see it. Uh, so I think that really when people see how beneficial it is to have broadband and they can use their mobile devices faster, better, and everywhere, they will realize that having this is, is really advantageous. And of course, helps to drive the economy. Cloud computing, I've mentioned already, a lot of progress is being made there. A cloud computing strategy was adopted last year, towards the end of last year, I believe it was in September. And again, a lot of progress is being made there. Uh, not legislative, but primarily working in the area of standards, improving contract terms, making sure that uh, SMEs know how, where, and what to do with uh, cloud contracts. And of course, personal data protection is an issue that is of particular importance in the context of cloud, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, trust and security I've mentioned as well. And uh, you know probably that at the beginning of this year, um, the Commission adopted a strategy on cybersecurity, which covers a whole series of issues. And uh, it's really going to be essential to make sure that citizens and businesses can use the Internet and use ICT in um, a, secure, uh, a secure environment. So this is a whole series of actions that are being taken to try to make sure that this is the case. Entrepreneurship and digital jobs and skills. I've mentioned the Grand Coalition for Digital Skills, and I'll go into that in a little bit more. There are a number of other actions relating to web entrepreneurs, digital entrepreneurs. You may have seen that the Entrepreneurship 2020 Action Plan, which was adopted recently, came out with a whole list of actions that have to be introduced, many of which are in the area of digital uh, skills and digital uh, entrepreneurship. 
and research and innovation. Now, in research and innovation, I would just mention, uh, and since most of you are academics, you have a direct interest in this, in Horizon 2020, again, the, uh, Andrea has mentioned the uh, decision of the Council in the multi-annual financial framework, uh, which in, on the one hand cut the broadband infrastructure uh, budget, but it has also cut the research and innovation budget. Now, one of the arguments was that this should still grow from previous uh, levels, but if you count up all the things that didn't used to be in Horizon 2020 that now are in Horizon 2020, like the COSME program, like innovation and uh, competitiveness and innovation program, like all the other aspects. Even with this so-called higher budget, it's not a real increase. It's pretty close to a very, very, very small increase. So. Since we think that this is an area where more investment in research and innovation, particularly at EU level, and where there's real benefits from collaboration, I think this is an area where we all have a particular interest in making sure that the right uh, policies are applied at the right time to benefit the right people. So I just wanted to tell you very briefly about the seven key transformative actions which were related to those seven areas that I identified. Uh, there will be a review of the Copyright Framework Directive, uh, the Directive on Network and Information Security I've mentioned, that's the cybersecurity action. Regulatory measures on non-discrimination and wholesale pricing relating to broadband, Andrea mentioned those at the beginning in his introductory speech. Uh, public sector infrastructure, that's the Connecting Europe facility, which is now only one billion, but we can still do a lot in digital services, I think, there. A common industrial strategy for micro and nano electronics will be rolled out in Horizon 2020. The European Cloud Partnership was adopted and is progressing quite well. And on the Grand Coalition on ITC Skills and Jobs, which I mentioned, we launched this already in early March uh, this year. And I think here, particularly for academics, this is an interesting area to focus on because it's estimated that uh, there will be up to 900,000 unfilled vacancies by 2015 in the ICT area. So we see that the demand is rising, but the number of new graduates coming out is staying more or less flat. And the other argument that industry always makes is that even though we get students coming out with ICT training, they don't have the real skills that we need. So there are a whole series of pledges that have been made to try to address this problem. This is one of the things that the conference did. And by the Digital Agenda Assembly, which will be in Dublin in June, it's expected that the even more pledges will come in and we will have an overview of where we are on this grand coalition. It has to take place at local, regional, and member state level, and we will try to help to coordinate at, at EU level. But this is an area where we really see a lot of potential uh, for making some important changes. And the Grand Coalition addresses uh, five different areas. I'm sorry about all the slides. I, I won't spend any time on them. One is a awareness raising, which is, of course, important. Uh, new learning modes and modules. ICT training. And mobility. So those are the areas of particular interest and importance. And then the last relates to certification. And this is an important aspect, particularly for industry, because they say, well, if X has been trained in a particular program, I don't know that they can use that program in my company, et cetera, et cetera. So the certification is to try to have more mobility and more uh, clear understanding of what uh, skills have been learned and to make sure that they're interoperable. They can be used in different companies in different circumstances. So I think with all those actions, we will, I hope, try to make some moves in those. So in a nutshell, what the Digital Agenda Review was supposed to do was to try to increase its impact, make sure that it uh, delved more into the area of growth and jobs, and we could see a little bit more how and what uh, those actions uh, resulted in. So that's all from me, some useful links. And as I said, the Digital Agenda Scoreboard is uh, something that I suggest all of you look at. It, it's really very uh, thorough. It has a lot of information, particularly 
member state by member state, but also sector by sector. And as I said, the new one will be out at the time of the Digital Agenda Assembly. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Megan. I will not use the privilege of the moderator by um, asking you the first question. Uh, I want to check first if in the audience we have uh, questions for you. Oh, you are being shy then. There's one on the back, Chris. <laughs> can they, even if everyone knows you, but you can still introduce yourself uh, before, um, before asking the question and wait for the mic that you now get. And you this have. is always the worst question because it's the one that may have been answered just before I came in, so apologies. <laughs> The European Interoperability Framework, um, th there's a, um, a cycle which you put up on one of the slides showing the value of um, uh, procurement and other actions to the public sector. Uh, the link between that, best practices in the public sector, and how that can influence the overall environment, uh, I wonder if you could say a couple of words about that. I'm, I'm not <laughs> up to date on the Interoperability Framework, and I should be. Oh, and I should say, Chris Marsden, University of Essex, but about to move to University of Sussex in 10 days. So. And that's why you were moving. You keep the suffixes. <laughs> um, well, on the European Interoperability Framework, I think it was adopted a few years ago. I've forgotten the exact date. But it was one of the first uh, of the actions to be adopted. Um, and I must say I don't know all the details of it. But in the public sector, one of the important areas relating to the use of standards in public procurement was Digital Agenda Action Number 23, which you can look at. And this is an area where I do know a little bit more, but it relates also very much to standardization and interoperability uh, because it was estimated, and I don't have the figures here with me, but it has been estimated that huge savings can be made by using standards in public procurement and using technical specifications rather than uh, brand names is, of course, beneficial. Uh, huge savings can be made. And the problem is that the public sector doesn't really use those standards. They don't know how to use the standards. They tend to go back and say, I'll have a Microsoft uh, 123 or an Oracle XYZ, etc., which, of course, creates lock-in. Um, so this uh, initiative is going through the process. Now, I expect that the commission communication will be out, where are we now, April? Uh, no, March. Uh, in early April, I would say. Mid-April, mid let's say. Uh, and this provides a whole series of guidelines for the public sector to use standards in their public procurement to help avoid lock-in, int introduce interoperability uh, by using standards and making these huge savings that are potential. And then on the European interoperability framework, I have colleagues who know every detail about it. So if you want to know more, I can give you that. But not now. In writing. Eric. Hello, Eric Boulin, uh, John Mission University. And I was curi curious to hear, I understand that there's been some recent promise by the Commissioner Cruz to make some major initiative in response to requests from the Council of Ministers to, to uh, uh, propose some new uh, ways how uh, uh, Europe should have more investments in ICT by October this year. Uh, you didn't comment on that specifically in your presentation, so I was a little bit curious on that. I don't remember saying new investments in ICT in October, but um, I, I did say that the European Council in March uh, said that they will have in October, at their October European Council, dedicated. Uh, a dedicated discussion on the digital agenda and digital single market. And one of the things they also said, and I can read it to you because it's always important to read these things exactly, there are two aspects that are going to be discussed. One is innovation, and the other is digital agenda and other services. And there it says that the Commission should report on the state of play and the remaining obstacles to be tackled to ensure the completion of a fully functioning digital single market by 2015. So that's one aspect. But the other is that it will report on concrete or identify concrete measures to establish the single market in information and communications technology as early as possible. So that second part 
is always subject and open to interpretation as to what that really means. Uh, some people say it means a new single telecom market, which has all sorts of implications. Some say it's just part of the digital single market, and this should be identified as identifying measures, first the barriers and then the measures to achieve it. So it's um, anyone's guess. With respect to the investments that and perhaps you're interpreting what I said about the Connecting Europe facility. Is that it? No, maybe this is too much the grapevine, but I understood that uh, the Commissioner uh, to the telecom ministers had made some significant promise that in October sh uh, the Commission or she would present some definite action plans on the digital agenda. I can add to this. Yeah, there's uh, more a rumor that has been uh, spread over, uh, even today, I think, yesterday and, and, to and today, about uh, new measures uh, upcoming for reducing the cost of NGN deployment throughout Europe. Uh, I don't know if you're, uh, uh, yeah, if you're uh, referring to but this. This, this is uh, the recommendation on uh, costing methodologies and non-discrimination. That must be it. In that sense, yes. I mean, this is part of the, the package, the broadband package. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> that, that's one of the elements. Uh, there's that recommendation. Uh, there's the reduction of civil costs. There are a whole series of other things related to it. But it's not new money. It's not. <laughs> it's new and different ways of reducing the cost. But it's not new cash. That's Warm for sure. encouragement. Uh, anyway, N Nelly doesn't have cash to give in this. It's the member states, of course, and it's the council that has to decide on that. But in the context of the Connecting Europe facility and the severe reduction in the budget, we're certainly going to have to look at new and better ways of identifying funding for the rollout of broadband infrastructure. That's absolutely clear. And whether that comes from structural funds, uh, private sector, uh, making the regulatory framework easier and better to work and encouraging investment from private sector, all those factors are going to be taken into consideration, that's for sure. But at least last time I looked, Nelly doesn't have a secret fund for that sort of thing. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, we have one uh, very quick uh, assistant, Maria, who uh, was, uh, mm -hmm. was able to, to go from one end to the other of the class in less than three seconds. So we, we, we rehearsed this before the conference. <laughs> Thank you. Ed Steinmuller from University of Sussex, Brew. Uh, my question is uh, uh, about uh, one of those indicators that you put up that you're not doing very well on, which is getting uh, more uh, households with a greater than 100 megabit per second uh, connection speeds. Uh, in your view, uh, uh, what can be done about that and what are the principal barriers that you see uh, uh, to moving that particular indicator? which? some may think was a little bit of a rash promise in the first place. Um, well, oops. First of all, the target is only for 2020, so it's always handy. I don't have to say that it's going to, you know, it could be that in December 20, uh, 2019, all of a sudden things change. It's always possible. One can always hope and dream. Uh, so I think there are a number of things. First of all, Again, I, I mentioned the issue of supply and demand. Uh, we've seen how dramatic growth has been with the use of uh, mobile wireless, uh, mobile devices. I think the Internet of Things and a whole and, and increasing uh, use of uh, video and, and content on uh, mobile devices and a series of other uh, developments will drive the demand. And the demand, I think, will then require the supply. There are a whole series of ways and means of doing this, and <laughs> other people much more knowledgeable than I know how to do this, but the cable people tell me that they can increase dramatically the capacity, and they all were already pass by 95% of houses in, in Europe, and it's a question of doing some technical adjustments to increase uh, the capacity. Now, whether it goes all the way to 100 megabits per second, I'm not sure, I, but I know they say they can do it. Satellite still is very useful for rural areas, but of course it doesn't have the speeds yet. But again, the satellite people are always telling me, don't worry, we can increase speed, we can increase capacity. It depends on how you do it, uh, where you download from, and whether you have hubs, etc. Then there's the question of how you roll out the broadband. The Brits have one 
procedure and, and method for doing it. Uh, BT does it one way. Uh, other countries do it other ways. So I think that one aspect that's particularly important is the use uh, by SMEs, and not just SMEs, but companies in general. And when they have higher uh, broadband uh, capacity and use, they will see and be able to use much better cloud computing facilities and all the other uh, advantages that go with it. Uh, so I think that driving the demand is a very important aspect, but also pushing the supply. So this is the role really of the member states, to drive forward the supply. How they do it and being technologically neutral uh, is really something that they have to take on themselves, I think. Perhaps not the answer you were looking for. But <laughs> the Commission can't do everything. Let's put it that way. Any other comment or question before we move to the next speaker? Um, I have uh, just, just a couple of remarks for Megan. Uh, I have many more, but you can see these on my notes. But uh, uh, one thing is that. Um, I don't know if you see the, because I see it uh, in my professional life, uh, in my academic life as well, um, an increased commingling of two different things, also in the digital agenda, but in general in EU policy. Uh, the fact that looking for innovation and growth uh, increasingly requires setting up the basic fundamentals and infrastructure for then having a bottom-up approach to innovation, so let uh, market forces uh, uh, interact in the various ways in which they can interact in which they increasingly interact with more speed and dynamics than any public authorities can actually follow, which is more what the digital agenda has sought to do, you know, to create the skills, the rule of law, the infrastructure, and so on. But then on the, the industrial policy wave, which is very big in Europe at this stage, with the, the return of these two terms which we couldn't put together before, at least until two or three years ago, which is industrial policy. And we have, a, we have a communication on industrial policy that dates uh, October last year, where part of the things that you were mentioning, uh, in particular the nanotech, the biotech, but a number of things in ICT will be deployed as industrial policy strategies, which are unlikely to be technology neutral. How do you see the coexistence of uh, DG Connect and DG Enterprise in this uh, strange conundrum? That's my first question. The second is much easier. Um, it seems to me that uh, in all this th that I've heard, uh, there is a major problem which you have highlighted, which is uh, skills and competences and jobs, uh, meaning um, uh, mobilizing the university system and creating the right competence and, and skills that are needed. I've seen estimates that are all slightly different from yours, even w worse, like 1.7 um, million jobs not covered in the cloud computing environment. Uh, there, there was a, a recent partnership being launched. Don't you think Europe is still too close to the idea of attracting talents from abroad uh, in this respect, from, from non-EU countries? I have myself uh, moderated, since I'm becoming a professional moderator, I don't know, I'm always moderating, uh, but uh, I've moderated a, a conference recently uh, in the occasion of the EU-Brazil ICT uh, strategic partnership. The delegation from Brazil came and they uh, actually complained because they have set up a plan to send out as many as 100,000 students for uh, being trained in, uh, in universities outside Brazil, and they were looking mostly at European universities, not just at U.S. universities. But the EU is the place where they find the most problems in bureaucratic terms, in, uh, in procedures, in uh, putting together their curricula, and so on. So it seems that both at the student side and at the researcher side, we have a huge problem in bringing in people uh, from non-EU countries. I don't know if you're tackling uh, this problem. Well, uh, let, let's talk about the second part first. Um, I think there are two aspects. First is bringing in students, training them, and then they go back home again. That's one thing, which is nice, useful, uh, sure. good for external relations, all sorts of other things. But it's not particularly useful if you want people to stay, provide the jobs, etc. So if a percentage of those people come, stay, and, and work in Europe, fine. And it doesn't mean that there, it's, it's not a useful thing. But I think already when we have huge, but huge levels of youth unemployment, particularly in some of the countries, some that you know quite well as well, uh, I think that to bring in lots of uh, foreign students, train them and send them back, it's nice, but it, it's, it's not going to solve the problem that we have here, and I'm not suggesting that we not do that, don't, g don't get me wrong, um, but I think bringing in foreign students to work and fill some of these gaps is an even better 
approach, at least temporarily. They also adopt and uh, adapt and uh, become more Europeanized and, and become ambassadors for Europe if and where they go, they go somewhere else. But the other aspect that is even more important is transforming some of the longer-term unemployed youth already uh, by giving them even some of the basic skills for ICT. That we've, I mean, we've seen some examples in Ireland, which is an, a good example, where long-term unemployed uh, people, young people, but not just young people, have been completely transformed by giving them very simple uh, coding, programming skills, and they go off and, and fill this uh, jobs gap. So. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not at all opposed or, or, or saying that we shouldn't do what we can to keep our universities and educational facilities open. Uh, but in the context of the Brazilians too, um, you know probably that in Portugal, the Portuguese have huge contacts yeah, with, with the Brazilians and, and lots of exchanges and, and the Portuguese have only about four hours time difference between Brazil and, and Lisbon, they, they speak the same language, they provide all sorts of services over the internet now, of course, you can do these things very quickly. Um, so I think it's, it's an interesting issue, but I, I think there are other ways and means of, of doing this. And some of the industry says, and this is not relating to, to opening up to students, but opening up to immigration, mm -hmm. uh, some of the industry says that even though they used to outsource some of these jobs to India or Philippines or wherever it might be, now they find that it's even better and more interesting for them to train people in Romania, in Bulgaria, or wherever it is, because they have the jobs, the language skills. Many of them have the basic STEM skills that are necessary, and they can then be upgraded to the requirements they need. And also, of course, they're closer. You know, if you need someone to come from Romania to Munich, it doesn't take all the, those many hours, or you need to get in touch with them. You, you don't have these time lags, etc. So. Uh, again, it's, it's useful and it's important. We need to have the right mix of uh, internal, external, et cetera. Now, on DG Connect and DG Enterprise, um, of course we work together. We have, like any bureaucracy, our own uh, problems and, and disputes. But I think in this area, particularly in the area of entrepreneurship, we have, at least in the Entrepreneurship 2020 Action Plan, introduced a whole series of areas where we have actions specifically addressed to digital entrepreneurship. And uh, those things go hand in hand. So again, we usually call it the supply-demand side, that uh, we deal with uh, supply and they deal with demand. Or maybe it's the other way around. I can never remember who's doing which. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I, 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 I don't think that's so much of a problem. But And I don't think that the industrial Please policy yeah. is contradictory to developing innovation because I don't think that innovation is going to grow because the public sector comes in. I'm not supposed to say that, but the public sector is not going to save innovation. Innovation has to grow in and of itself. I, yeah, I don't know. That's probably uh, due to the fact that before coming here, I was involved in a completely different meeting at DG Enterprise on steel and aluminium. Oh, my goodness. So, we well, really, I so saw industrial last policy last coming back, so stay tuned on that because uh -huh. I think it's coming back really from the 50s till mm. today. And um, definitely we're already behind schedule, but what you c can you expect with an Italian moderator? So I, I'll try to catch up a little bit yeah. by uh, p uh, giving the, the, the floor to uh, Jorgen Abil uh, Andersen. You can choose to be sitting there or going to the podium. Jorgen, you're now Director General of uh, Telecom Danish Business Authority. And, uh, of course, many of us know you for also what you did in the past, uh, Chairman of the ERG and the IRG. Uh, so you are a very well-known person in this field, very able to echo what Megan said in policy terms and you know, offering us your very ex experienced views. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, thank you very much for, for the introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a great honor for me to be here, to have been invited, and uh, it's also an honor to, to follow up on Megan's uh, very good intervention. I got a law background as Megan, um, and uh, Megan claimed that she's not a techie, but despite that, she started a, a wonderful PowerPoint show, and she did it <laughs> great. I, I abstained from that from the very beginning. I, I will not enter into this. So uh, you have to, to um, listen to the spoken word only. That's the Danish tradition. 
Um, I'll talk um, with the background. I'm, I'm, as I was introduced, I have been a telecom regulator in Denmark for much longer time that I like to remember more than 20 years. But uh, now it's over. Actually, I'm retiring at the end of this month. But I'm carrying on as uh, chairman of the OECD Committee on the Internet Economy, the ICCP Committee, uh, which is great fun. And uh, I will talk uh, partly on that background, but mainly maybe conveying to you the views of Jörn Abil Andersen. So, uh, but, but uh, as I said, I will have OECD as my background, as, and as you know, and I want to say that uh, while uh, Megan is still sitting here in the room, you know, OECD is covering a much larger area than the European Union, which is only a small fraction of, of the OECD area. So the findings, it's very provocative, uh, Megan. I only say that because we know each other well. Uh, but um, you know, OECD is covering quite a large part of the world uh, economy. It's a decreasing part of the world economy, and that's why OECD is very concerned about uh, outre outreach activities. We have identified uh, five key partner countries and we are very concerned about getting into contact with these key partner countries. It's China, it's India, Indonesia, South Africa and Brazil. And very much of our efforts are concentrated on bringing these countries uh, under our umbrella. It's very difficult, I must admit. I agree a lot with what Megan has said about the importance of ICTs. I think that it is um, increasingly becoming evident that ICTs is of vital importance for innovation, growth, productivity, and also for the creation of new jobs. And isn't that exactly what our political masters are asking for? My answer is yes. And that is why it is so important to carry on, and that is why when we are talking about Europe, uh, Commissioner Cruz has a very important agenda in dealing with the digital agenda. She considers herself as the commissioner, not for DG Connect, but for the digital agenda. I think uh, I'm right in this. So, but just to remind you, and uh, it's maybe like preaching to the choir, I want to remind you with showing or giving you some facts that ICTs really is important. And it's, I'll, I'll repeat some of the, the figures mentioned by Megan and add uh, another couple of figures. Having done this, I will touch upon two issues where I think I disagree with Megan to a wide extent on the first issue. And uh, the second issue was not touched upon by, by Megan, but I, maybe we agree more on, on that if, if, you, if you were touching up, upon that. The two challenges, the two issues I will, will talk about, um, I, I will mention these issues because I think that if we don't do things right and deal with those issues appropriately, uh, these two areas can prevent us from reaping the full benefits of ICTs in the future. And, and this is very, very important that we do it right. And I think that on the first issue, I don't think that the Commission is completely right in all aspects. The first issue is to get the broadband discussion right, striking the right balance between supply and demand and focus of our efforts in, in that respect. And I think the Commission is doing things wrong and the discussion is slightly polluted, to, to be very frank. The second issue I want to mention is about finding a constructive way forward following up on the outcome of WICKET, uh, a constructive way forward with respect to Internet governance. I think that those of us who were in Dubai. I had the pleasure of being together with Megan for a couple of weeks down in a very nice climate in Dubai. We spent most of our time in an air-conditioned meeting room without windows. But anyway, it was a, what did you say, Megan? You said it was a surreal experience, and I can only agree to this. But uh, coming back to illustrating the vital importance of ICTs for innovation, growth, productivity, and, and new jobs, 
when we look at OECD and look at the last 15 years of development of the ICT sector and compare it with the OECD business sector, it is evident that growth has been clearly strongest within ICTs. The annual growth rate in the business sector in this 15-year period was 3.2%, 3.2%, while it was 5.1% for ICT services and 39 for total ICTs, a substantial higher degree of growth within ICTs. And you also can recall the figures mentioned in the Digital Agenda for Europe about ICTs as responsible for 5% of European GDP, market value of 660 million, billion euro annually, and a substantial contribution to productivity growth within the European Union. I, I don't, you're familiar with these figures. I will not go into detail. Uh, but I think that the figures reflected in the Digital Agenda for Europe are very, very impressive. And they are so impressive and so essential for understanding the importance of ICTs and the digital economy that we should not, people like us present in the room, we should not abstain from repeating these figures over and over again because it is so important to bring everybody understand that this is vital to focus on ICTs. And I want to quote Vice President Cruz, who said, it's, uh, I cannot recall the exact time when she said, I think it was last year, but, but she phrased it very, very elegantly when she said, ICT res is responsible for half of Europe's productivity growth and a quarter of our GDP growth. ICT is therefore at the heart of our economy. I think it's a very good way of phrasing it, and I use this quote every time I have the opportunity. So I think that at least in our part of the world, in Europe, we are all aware that we are dealing with something very important, very important not least as a measure to overcome the economic crisis. But also globally, ICTs and the Internet economy attracts a lot of attention these years. Of course, in, in, in OECD, in my committee, the committee I'm chairing, the ICCP committee, which is dealing with the Internet economy. But also in the G8 context, uh, it has been discussed. In May 2011, there was a G8 meeting in Deauville, uh, and uh, it was, there was a special session on the Internet economy, and McKinsey had drafted a report for this particular session with some very interesting conclusions and I also keep on repeating these conclusions over and over again. I will share them with you. You may know them already, but there are three interesting conclusions which I want to point out here today. According to McKinsey, the internet has generated as, as much growth over the past 15 years as the industrial revolution did in 50 years. 15 years? 50 years. It goes very fast. Over the past five years, the Internet has been responsible for 21% of growth in mature economies. And the third, and in my view, most interesting conclusion is about jobs, because the Internet has a very large indirect platform effect of vital importance for the creation of new jobs. The McKinsey study says that over the past five years, the Internet has created 2.6 jobs for every job it has displaced. So the Internet, the use of the Internet, is a job generator, not the opposite way around. Of course, it may not be the same people being superfluous as those being employed, but the total account says 2.6 new jobs for every job displaced. A very interesting conclusion and of course in particular in a time with a high rate a stable high rate unfortunately of unemployment I would also like to mention the um, uh, broadband report issued in the United States I think it was last year where there were some very interesting figures about a small fraction of the ICT environment what you could call the app economy the app economy in the United States is responsible for an annual turnover of $20 billion. And it has created 
466,000 new jobs. And I emphasize new jobs. Five, ten years ago, these jobs did not exist. Five, ten years ago, this industry did not exist. Completely new, out of the blue, I would almost say. Very interesting. And I would add uh, just four more fa facts. You, you, there are so many interesting figures. Megan already uh, gave some of them. Uh, I picked four facts, figures, which I in particular find interesting because they really describe what this world is about. And it also reflects the difference between the developed world and the developing world. And I think you also touched upon that in, in your intervention. In developed markets, the internet economy will grow at an annual rate of 8% over the next five years. 8% per year over the next five years. This figure far outpaces the traditional economic sector. It's much higher growth, 8% per year over the next five years. But 8% is nothing compared to what is happening in developing countries. In developing countries, the growth rates of the internet economy will be 18% per year. This is more than twice as fast. It's really rapidly evolving. The third point I want to make here is that the internet economy of the G20 will nearly double between 2010 and 2016 when it will employ 32 million more people than today. 32 million more people. A very strong impact on employment. And the fourth and last uh, point in this context will be about um, 11 of the G20 countries where small and medium enterprises that embrace the internet have experienced revenue growth that was up to 22% higher than that achieved by SMEs with low or no use of internet. So there is a direct importance of going digital with respect to your business. It's directly reflected in, in the figures and we have already seen that it is so important. That's another good reason for focusing on uh, ICTs and the digital development. What is coming up now? What are our challenges? And now I come to the point where I disagree with Megan to some extent. I think that we can all agree that the development within ICTs and the internet has indeed been very successful over the last many years. Our successful development within ICTs is related to a very successful liberalization in the late 90s and uh, to subsequent impressive developments within wireless and within broadband. For users, this development has been only positive. They have experienced a dramatic decrease in tariffs and a wide range of new services and devices have been provided. On top of this, access to bandwidth, uh, which one could only dream of a uh, few years ago. Consumers now have access anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Everybody should be happy, more than happy. But more wants more. Vice President Cruz asked the questions, how can we get broadband for all? And the telcos represented by Etno are complaining about the regulatory regime which they claim undermines their incentives in making investments in broadband. Last year, Etno invented a very creative new business model uh, for consideration in Dubai at the ITR revision. And uh, I will not go into detail on this, but when I say sending party pays, I think that everybody knows here in this room what I'm aiming at. In short, I've understood that this model uh, implies that once a user acquires information on the internet via a service provider, provider like for example Google, then Google will have to pay for the traffic to the telco. And the same would apply for example if somebody uh, goes to the European Commission and asks for information, then the European Commission would have to pay. It's, it's uh, in my view completely crazy, but uh, well, 
I think yeah. then we agree. <laughs> but I think it, it died that model. To really understand what is driving the digital development, I think it is important to look at four areas which together are interlinked and together are very important for the development. E-infrastructure, E-skills, E-security, and E-content. Remember these four elements. They are interlinked and they are very important and only when they have a good uh, interrelationship you'll get a successful digital development. It does not make sense and does not give any digital development if you don't have a world-class e-infrastructure available. Megan and I agree on this, I'm sure. It doesn't make sense if people do not have the necessary e-skills to use the infrastructure. There we have a little bit of a difference in views. I'll come back to that. It doesn't make sense where, the, where there's not an appropriate level of e-security giving citizens trust and confidence in using the internet, in using the e-infrastructure. There we agree. Fourthly, on top of this, nobody will use the infrastructure if it cannot be used to access useful, attractive e-content because such content is not there, it's not offered in the market. If there are no appealing services and applications at the end of the line, the digital development will never take off. Coming back to the question about skills, I don't know whether our meetings in the high-level group on the digital agenda are secret, or can I reveal one intervention I made myself? I think that the Grand Coalition is a very good idea, and you, and you gave on your slide the good arguments. We will be in desperate need of competent people who can deal with different IT issues. But what the Commission is forgetting, and I and others have clearly pointed out that uh, the Commission should deal also with this, is the level of e-skills, e-competences among ordinary citizens. You cannot expect um, ordinary citizens in society to use e-health services, uh, other forms of e-government services if they simply do not know what a computer looked like, what if they don't know how to master a, a, a PC at all. You have to focus on this because this is one of the most essential factors to make this fly, that you develop useful e-content, be it e-government services, but you must make sure that citizens actually are able to use these services. And the challenge is there. It's a great challenge, and you have to be uh, concerned about that. Having said this, having pointed out the importance of, of being concerned about the interrelationship between these four areas, my point this afternoon will be the following. I think that too much of the discussion these last couple of years uh, has been about the rollout of broadband. The CEF, the CEF facility discussion is, is clearly reflecting this. There is this uh, idea about taxpayers' money should be used for pushing a supply uh, forward which nobody knows whether it's needed or not. I think that this focus on the e-infrastructure only is a problem about the supply side, about investments, about incentives for investments, about the role of governments and telecom regulators in, in this uh, respect. This way of viewing things, in my view, is much too narrow, much too narrow. Focus on the supply side is not sufficient to make things happen by far not. And let me give you an example which illustrates my point, an example from my own country, Denmark. We have in my country a very ambitious goal for uh, broadband dissemination, broadband connectivity. In, by 2020, uh, every Dane in Denmark, no matter where he or she lives, should have the possibility of 
getting a 100 megabit per second connection. 2020, 100 megabits. Quite ambitious. Maybe not the most ambitious in Europe, but near the top. Already now we see a dramatic increase in the number of businesses and households who can get a 100 megabit connection if they so wish. Let me give you the figures for 2010, for 2011, and for 2012. 2010, 25%. One year later, 38%. And in 2012, 65%. A dramatic increase in the availability. The problem is the take up. The take up in 2010, 0.5%. One year later, 0.5%, and in 2012, there was a slight increase, 0.8%. So we have a lot of fat pipes in Denmark, but they are empty fat pipes, empty fat pipes. So, and I come back to my point, focus, Megan, on the supply side is not sufficient. Much more has to be done. Focus, in my view, must be on supporting the development of useful and appealing services and applications. This is not a question about necessarily using um, reg regional funds, using regulatory measures, anything. I think that one important means could be that government could act as a, could, could use its purchasing power could develop e-government further, could, could make a revolution in e-government services, which could create this demand. And I think I have listened carefully to, to the outcome of the F MFF, MFF negotiations and this reduced amount of money. I think it's 1 billion euro now. And I also heard that this should not be used for infrastructure but, but for services. I applaud. I have two minutes left. Look, I started late. Anyone counting that? Sorry. OK. <laughs> so, but uh, this is only one thing, and I, I should try to be, be brief. I think I got my point across. Government can do a lot. I think one other important area of activity would be the area of big data. And I'm very, very disappointed, Megan, that you didn't mention big data in your, in your presentation. You, you mentioned PSI. Yes, and I, sh I think you should carry on with by doing so because that was one of four messages coming out of the uh, Danish presidency conference during the Danish presiden presidency last uh, spring uh, that, that all EU countries agreed at that conference that big data was one of four areas of, of uh, activity which you, you should uh, carry on with. So, so I think this is, um, this is important and uh, well, I think that we all know that big data should be considered as a raw material for developing new services and applications. And I can only say it's so encouraging what is coming out of this. We are doing a lot in OECD, and I can say that uh, OECD is carrying out currently a cross-sectoral project uh, named New Sources of Growth. And uh, in phase two, for which my committee is responsible, big data is the key issue for discussion. And we are really... Uh, doing a lot on this. I will, I will shorten my, my intervention, and uh, if you allow me, I, I will just take the second challenge, because I think it's, it's very important, and it's about the governance model for the Internet. Many of you, if not all, knows that this model is, is currently being criticized, and uh, uh, Megan and I experienced uh, in, in Dubai that uh, many countries are really very critical uh, versus um, this uh, governance model uh, currently being applied and they think that governments are not sufficiently involved. We all know that the Internet has developed over the last 20 years to become an extremely powerful driver for the information society. And the basis for this is the multi-stakeholder driven governance model which is concentrated around ICANN, uh, which operates under the auspices of the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce 
and uh, with some 120 countries in the Government Advisory Committee uh, providing advice to ICANN in a very formalized way. Is that a sustainable regime for the years to come? What is the state of play? Well, uh, the OECD Council in, 2011, in December 2011 um, adopted a recommendation on Internet policy principles. In, in this uh, recommendation, it was clearly stated that the OECD Councils want the current um, governance model, the multi-stakeholder driven approach, to continue also in, in the future. Um, this is not a job for governments to manage. Govern governments should be one or more stakeholders taking part in the process. This is the OECD view. And I think that everybody must uh, admit that this model has provided excellent results so far. The US ambassador here in Brussels to the European Union, Bill Kenar, said, um, he phrased it very elegantly, right to the point, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I can only agree with him. I think that Dubai last year made a meant a change. The ITRs were up for the international telecom regulations were up for revision and many countries wanted the ITRs or the scope of the ITRs to be extended to, also, to cover also the internet. From um, uh, the European countries we opposed to this, um, China and Russia and uh, countries in the Middle East were very vocal in their wish to to extend the scope. And there was an, some interesting um, viewpoints expressed by the Secretary General of ITU, Hamadoun Touré. He said before the conference, and I think also at the beginning of the conference, that there would be no extension of the scope of ITRs. And on top of this, he secured, or he, he said very clearly that there would be no vote to get a result results should be obtained by consensus. He failed on both his promises, and in my view, his reputation now is ruined. He's really down in esteem, I think. I don't know if... In some countries. In some countries. Well, I think, <laughs> yeah, in, in, uh, in European countries, I think, I think he's, he's very... He's not esteemed anymore. The scope of ITR was extended to cover also Internet-related issues, and... The result was achieved through a vote where a large minority, uh, including the European countries, US, Canada, Costa Rica, Qatar, mm -hmm. Kenya, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, um, were left as a minority. And uh, the majority um, obviously wanted uh, stronger government influence. So you could ask the question, is a digital Cold War developing? I think Commissioner Cruz asked that question recently. And uh, like Commissioner Cruz, I hope not, and I, 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 I think, I think we, that we should do all we can to prevent this from happening. What can be done? A lot can be done. Enhancing and improving the reputation of ICANN and uh, the Government Advisory Committee could be one very powerful means to ensure continuation of this uh, successful governance model that has been applied so far. How can this be done? And that would be my last point, Andrea, if you allow me. Good. Quick point. Quick point. Very quick. According to the so-called AOC Affirmation of Commitments, which is an agreement between ICANN and the U.S. Department of Commerce, which is the constitution, so, so to speak, for, for ICANN's work, um, ICANN has to carry out a so-called accountability and transparency review every third year. Fabio Colasanti represented Europe three years ago in the first review, and uh, I have been selected as one of the members of ATRT2 uh, this time, and I took part, actually, in the first meeting last week in Los Angeles. I pointed at a number of issues as important items for this ATRT, Above all, I think that the ATRT should be very much focused on recommendations which aim at enhancing the legitimacy of ICANN to bring the reputation away from the myth that 
ICANN is a U.S. body strongly, strongly linked with the U.S. government, sucking blood out of the veins of poor countries in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and Latin America. ICANN has a newly appointed Director General, Fadi Shihadi, and he has already spotted this challenge, and uh, he's doing a great job, in my view, reaching out to countries all over the world to explain what are the realities in the current governance model. It seems that he is quite successful in, in doing so, and I think that we should all support him in his efforts. But on top of this, a lot of improvements in ICANN's way of working, including the relations to the Government Advisory Committee and the way the Government Advisory Committee is working can be made. All this are important steps to be taken in order to ensure the successful development of the Internet. And why is this so important? Well, it's extremely important because the Internet is vital for the digital development as a driver for innovation, growth, productivity, and new jobs in Europe as well as the rest of the world. And that's what we want, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorgen. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have much time for debate, otherwise uh, the, the last speakers in the session after the coffee break will speak, uh, let's say, after midnight. So, and SEPS doesn't close, but, but uh, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest it anyway. So, um, let me see if there are, if you concentrate, and you, and you can formulate quick questions, but this, this is not enough. This must, must be quick questions that require quick answers. There's one there. Are you sure you reflected uh, the full extent of this? <laughs> Pressure's on. It's a yes-no. <laughs> it's not a yes-no, <laughs> but, but it'll be fast. Uh, I'd like to pick up on what you said just at the end about ICANN and GAC. Um, you didn't have time to elaborate how you think that um, the advisory committee could be improved. Could you just say something short about that? There's no short answer to this, but I'll try anyway. Well, I, I can give you an example. Uh, I think that you all know about the new GTLD um, uh, model which is introduced. I think that, uh, well now I'm talking about the diagnosis, I think it's amazing to see that the applications for GTLDs is very numerous when talking about North America and only very few applications have been received from Africa and Latin America. So this, in my view, is a very good example of where ICANN should improve substantially. And that is why uh, Director General um, Fadi Shihadi's outreach activities is so important. Because it only supports the myth that this is a UA issue run to the benefit of United States companies and nobody else. All right, any other such questions? <coughs> Eric has one, and then... Uh, uh, a question to both, uh, Megan and, and uh, Jürgen. Uh, you paint a very quite positive picture of, of, so to say, information society technologies that they are you know, transforming uh, Europe and the uh, world otherwise. Uh, in a, in a previous study we did on, with, based on input-output analysis, a time series from 95 to 2010. Now it's input-output analysis, so a little bit a rig stifled type of method, uh, and also old data. But it suggests that there is a trend that <coughs> if we look at the ICT sectors, which c can be then three sectors of the 49 European-wide sectors, the ICT sector in Europe has become more and more isolated, that is decoupled, so that absorptive capacity of the other sectors has been reduced over time. So that would suggest that just investing more in ICT would not be giving Europe higher benefit, but there is some other structural problems in the other sectors. So my question is, in your role at OECD or the European Union, where you, the Commission where you're sitting, did you come across any other analysis like that that suggests that the ICT, the information society, is not really realizing its potential in that way. There are some other structural problems in Europe. Well, 
other structural problems, I think that's absolutely clear. Huh? Uh, and I think it's clear too that if we were to just pour money into ICT without changing some of those structural problems, we wouldn't advance. That's, that's absolutely clear. There are all sorts of problems relating to the legislative and financial framework. Uh, if you think about uh, the problems that entrepreneurs face, if we were just to drive more money into web entrepreneurs without changing the problems relating to bankruptcy, labor laws, etc., it, it's still an uphill struggle. Huh? So, uh, and I'm sure uh, Jorgen has much more information from the OECD perspective of that, which is not to say that it's not useful investment as well. Um, so I'd be interested to see your, your Stud studies, yeah. Well, well I, I think that uh, you come from a university, from the academic world. I would not question the validity of the, the results of your research. I, I think that you might very well be right. Um, what I'm seeing and what we are doing in the OECD is that we have um, changed our approach dramatically over the years. We have been working in a very isolated ICT world. Um, we are transforming our activities to broaden the scope or to broaden the, the activity. I mentioned that OECD is working on a cross-sectoral project called New Sources of Growth. This is an indication that what we are doing within the ICT sector is meant not to be only of benefit to this very limited environment, but to be to the benefit of the whole of society. We, we, we are aiming at a much more holistic approach, bringing ICTs into everything. And I could add that taking Denmark as an example, my minister, the Minister for Business and Growth, has taken the initiative of establishing eight so-called growth teams in different sector, sectors, the maritime world, tourism, design, um, ICTs and growth. But the interesting thing is that within each of the eight growth teams, which is composed by people representing industry and, and large businesses, every of these growth teams are pointing at the importance of using ICTs as a means of enhancing the businesses in that particular uh, area. So ICTs is really in everything. And I hope that your next uh, research results will show that ha there has been a change. Hopefully so. I think I have to cut the discussion here. May, yeah, I, may I just make a two or three small points, very, very short points, uh, compared to what Jorgen said. Inclusive points. Okay. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, Jorgen said that uh, he, he disagreed with the Grand Coalition on, on uh, digital jobs because it didn't address uh, basic digital, di digital literacy, let's call it that. I, I supported but it. It was not enough, I said. Uh, yeah. okay, we'll no, no, but it, no, it's, no, of no, course no. it's not enough. It's not intended to solve all the problems. It's only addressed at this a gap between the supply and demand of ICT skills in ICT. It has nothing to do with digital literacy per se and the general digital literacy issue. So I just wanted to clarify that. There are all sorts of other activities going on to develop and further digital literacy. So just to, for the record, to, to clarify that. And on the other issue I wanted to uh, mention was on demand. Uh, and and I, I thought I mentioned it earlier on public sector innovation. I mean, I think that's where huge amounts of demand for broadband will go. If you n need to have telemedicine, e-health, uh, e-government, e-services, these are where huge demand will develop. It's not by having teenagers use their videos. Uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that's a good use of <laughs> their time. But it's not, that's not what's going to drive it. It's, it's really these other services that, that will drive the demand. So uh, we don't disagree on that. Okay. And on big data, I, I, I have been accused of being a big data bore. So I thought I would stop a little bit. But I agree. All right. Well, thank you very much for the discussion. Uh, I think it's now time to go.
believe that the, 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 the conclusion coming out of these should be very useful to the descriptive part of the discussion. Um, so, just as a concept, digitization is uh, essentially what we're talking about here is measuring not only infrastructure, but what is it that we do with the technology. It's the use of technology. It's the fact that uh, we might have a ton of fiber or dog feet free out there, and uh, we might have a lot of PCs, but what is it that we actually do? What is the value that we derive out of this, including the mobile dimension as well? So, um, in a sense, what we're trying to see here is to measure uh, applications, e-government services, e-commerce penetration as a percentage of, of, of retail commerce, uh, social networking uh, in its productive and non-productive dimensions, uh, the availability of information and the like. So we're merging everything into a single indicator, trying to understand to what extent societies are moving along these sort of digitization paths. Um, in doing so, we're trying to focus ourselves at three levels. Individuals, uh, obviously uh, uh, enterprises and society as a whole, the delivery of goods and services, and the delivery of public services. So we're trying to integrate all those perspectives. Now, granted, you might want to say, well, is, to what extent that is easy to, 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 to meld into a, a single indicator. It might be useful to uh, ascertain what level of a society is relative to all these multiplicity of, of, of numbers and come up with a single uh, index that would enable us to calibrate, are we moving in the right direction? Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, technology has to be affordable, ubiquitous, and the like. Um, let me just move ahead. This is the structure of the index. So we have, think of it like all of you are very familiar with the web um, uh, GITR index when they talk about pillars. Well, in this case, our pillars are affordability. How cheap is the technology? Can we afford it? Uh, mobile and broadband. Uh, um, the infrastructure, the re reliability of the infrastructure, to what extent? This is, this is, these are good networks. And uh, are they not prone to failure or saturation? Um, the access side is to what extent the devices are out there that enable us to access the network. Usage, and that's what I was talking about before. What is it that we're doing with this stuff? Uh, are we buying more goods on the internet? Are we accessing a government services? Uh, are we connecting uh, on a point-to-point -point communication with our um, uh, peers? Um, what is the capacity of the network? And this is very important going forward because as you know, uh, whether we like it or not, Roughly, I'd say 70% of our networks today are consumed by video. And video is what dr is driving the growth. You know that, um, for instance, every iPhone consumes roughly 670 megabits a month of capacity, most of it being video, and most of it being um, you know, YouTube stuff and things that we might not be that productive. But nevertheless, the networks are being strained by these kind of requirement. And then the human capital. Do we have the right people to develop the right applications for the usage that we want to have out of these networks? So we meld all those and, and, and we create an index and these are the sources and I'm not, not gonna um, uh, um, bore you with that. And we took 150 countries around the world. And we said, well, where are countries relative to all those dimensions? And, 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 and countries are basically, I mean, although um, as you can see, there's no dramatic change from one stage to the other, but in four stages. We have constrained countries, which are the usual suspects with very poor countries. Uh, we have the emerging ones that are moving in the right direction in terms of digitization. Transitional ones that we would expect to become the advanced, and then uh, you know, the industrialized countries, essentially, um, all, all along that path. And, and, and the, uh, the break-even points are, uh, if you're above 50 in that index, you're in an advanced situation. Um, when we decouple this, and this is a little bit of a Christmas tree, tree chart, but it's very interesting, we took the 150 countries and we look not at the total value, but what each country was having as an index relative to the dimensions that I was talking about before. So how high is Norway scoring in affordability in terms of the ability to provide these, these goods, these digital goods to the population? Or how good is Norway in terms of the reliability of infrastructure or the accessibility of networks by having devices being adopted by the population? And here's where something very uh, startling starts to emerge. Because if I look at the red line, which is affordability, I could venture to say that only when you get to countries in the uh, range of Cambodia, affordability is becoming a problem. That the, the industry has 
primarily on, on, on the wireless side for sure, but increasingly on the broadband side, tackle the problem of how much to pay for it. I mean, we can argue with this, there might be noise in the data, but basically it says that affordability, if you were to take a, the end of a stick and say, where am I going to focus policy-wise? Maybe cost is not the issue. I mean, cost, I mean prices. The red, the green line is accessibility, is whether we have the devices to access the network. And if it's less of a, pro I mean, it's less of a, a good picture than affordability, nevertheless, he's pushing it there. But where the big problems are, are in usage and in, and in human capital, are in infra infrastructure reliability. But basically what the chart says is that if I'm a policymaker and I'm developing, you know, industrial strategy, also development strategy, where do I, where, where I want to focus on? I want to focus on usage. I want to focus on development of human capital. I mean, it's less of a problem on the industrialized countries, but nevertheless, the gap is still there. So that's one of the first messages to remember, which actually is quite coincident with some of the things that were mentioned before. Um, the next thing we did is we took 18 countries, and now we looked at them over time, from 1995 to 2011, and trying to understand um, is there any policy element that actually triggers a jump in digitization? Uh, is there a development path uh, that you can say, well, you have the Anglo-Saxon path towards Valhalla, and then you might have the, the, the uh, Korean path, or you might have the Japanese path. And uh, we start with the U.S., and, and this is what the U.S. has done from 1995 to 2011. And clearly, some effects, although not dramatic, have to do with the dot-com bubble that was triggered in 1995, which created a jump. And then sort of like, again, a sort of an expansion of liquidity in the markets that enabled investment in infrastructure and development of applications. Liquidity was very critical in the U.S. But because that triggered a lot of, you know, misspent money and good stuff relative to the development of the industry. Then we compare them with Norway and Sweden. And here something very interesting starts happening. And there might be some noise in the data on Sweden being the red line and Norway being the blue. But something happened policy-wise starting in the late 90s in both Scandinavian countries that enabled them to catch up dramatically and surpass the U.S. in terms of digitization. I mean, obviously, it, those are familiar with the Scandinavian countries know that there was development of infrastructure, there was um, digital literacy efforts, there was um, trying to create a larger capillary of those networks at, uh, within the country beyond the capitals. Uh, and, and those are some of the elements. But clearly policy had some impact here because otherwise, you know, look at the distance that existed between Norway and Sweden and the U.S. and the beginning, in the mid of the 90s. Um, we added to that uh, Korea. And clearly Korea is a very nice case of a leapfrogging situation where they were in 1995 in, in the stone age of digitization and a dramatic jump over like five years where they moved they propel themselves from a 10 uh, score to roughly 50. Concentrated industrial policy. Concentrated, not only industrial policy, but if you look at the Korean experience, the most startling thing that we found was executive leadership. It was that the, the responsibility for implementing policy was not distributed within different ministries and agencies, but there was a central accountability at the executive branch that said, this is what we're going to do. And you better do it. Now, this you better do it is quite interesting when you turn these to, um, well, this is just shows you the convergence on industrialized countries, which says something very important when it comes to convergence. I'm going to come back to the you better do it. Look at the convergence of some of the industrialized countries. This is important because it says that, in fact, that the competitive advantage that industrialized countries can derive out of digitization is narrowing down. We don't have that much advantage if we were to be better than a Korea or another, because, you know, there's a convergence a la, a la Simon Kuznets, a, a la Barrow effect, that where pretty much every one of us is looking the same. So how are we going to carve a niche that would enable us to compete being a European relative to the U.S. or Korea? That's a very critical question. Um, but now, just to give you a sense, this is what happened in, in um, uh, emerging countries. And emerging countries have the same kind of jumps, although more dramatic. These are leapfrog effects, fascinating leapfrog effects. When you have constrained demand, 
because supply is not there, where you have um, state-owned enterprises, uh, a lot of things. Suddenly, you privatize like Brazil did. Look at the jump on, on digitization that Brazil did. Look at the jump that Brazil had, although the jump in the, in, uh, in the mid-2000s had to do more with the, um, the issue of, of Lula's policies of income redistribution, where basically the, middle, the poor middle class was buying broadband, uh, a ton of broadband. Um, so that's very interesting. Now, the other one that I call your attention on, you better do it, is the Chinese example. China started again in the Stone Age, and little by little, without big jumps, is moving progressively uh, to, you know, to the front of the BRICS and, uh, and, and, and going that direction. To some extent there in China, we have not an issue necessarily of policy. Clearly centralization, and clearly if you don't do it, you know what will happen. So there's something that, trade-offs that we have to deal with. We have a political system that is highly centralized, highly punitive, although very effective, to moving us along the path of digitization, something obviously that we are not willing to adopt. But nevertheless, that's the case in the Chinese uh, example. In sum then, we have different development paths, different practices, clearly li li liberalization of telecoms is critical for spillovers, but there's also a combination of government involvement and private sector participation. I'm gonna come back to that now. Um, economic impact, is this important? To what extent can we say that we're, we're getting a return or, uh, or on a social investment. And if you look at correlationally, you can see that GDP and digitization index are correlated, but this doesn't say anything for any uh, econometrician. So we had to start peeling the onion and seeing, well, is there any sort of relationship at the more um, uh, sophisticated econometric tools? And uh, the first thing is to build a Cobb Douglas function that says, well, let's relate digitization to uh, investment, uh, capital formation, and labor, and seeing to what extent what is the role that, that digitization might have. And digitization has a very important position. Now, uh, uh, just as a side, I, I don't buy on the World Bank estimates that were quoted by Ms. Richards about the 1.5 impact, because I think that they're way beyond the real impact of broadband and uh, and, and they haven't been proven analytically or replicated. But nevertheless, the impact is there. Now, the more important thing, and I'm gonna jump these numbers, is this one. What I'm comparing here is the impact of digitization to the classical studies that I, oops, sorry, that I did and, and other people did on the impact of broadband. Where you can see the, 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 the impact that broadband penetration might have. Look what happens with digitization. It seems as if that once we know what to do with the stuff that we're deploying on the ground, the economic impact is much larger than what we would have had if we were just deploying infrastructure, which makes sense. I mean, you know, it's like beyond the construction effect of railways or electricity or, or, or broadband, the issue is the spillover effects that this stuff has on the economy as a whole. Well, the jump is pretty high in terms of the difference on the payback. Once we figure out all the applications, this is where we really start getting the returns on, on the investment. And, um, and more importantly, there's something else that is occurring. And uh, what we did here is we, rather than doing it as a whole, we divided countries in the four stages. And we say, uh, is, is the impact increasing with the development of digitization? And we found something very interesting, which in economics we call it return to scale. The more of the stuff we are doing and using, the higher the impact on, on GDP. Now that's very important because it says, well, let's keep on pushing. Now, granted, if you look at the coefficient, something happens at the transitional advanced level where, where it, it, sort of like, it, it, it sort of like stops growing. And maybe we still haven't figured out how, we, how to squeeze all the value out of this technology yet. And, uh, and that's something that we need to do. But moving from the very low to the low and even to the uh, medium, we can see that there is something of an increasing effect. So the, 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 the payback, the, the, the rewards are increasing with with more development of this. This is not just a, a linear relationship. There's something else going on. <coughs> Labor, the same thing, and we have the, again, the, the, the econometrics, I'm not gonna uh, bore you with that. And the one that we are pushing right now is whether we can have any impact on well-being, which is more of the softer things. Is there something to be said about life satisfaction? Are we getting something out of this beyond like more jobs and, and, and better 
uh, money. I mean, it's, obviously that contributes to satisfaction, but nevertheless, is there something else? And that's what we're trying to do right now, and, and we're nowhere to be able to measure this because the, the tools are not that, then the metrics are not that good, uh, except for like what Gallup generates in terms of life quality and life satisfaction and things of that sort. But that's what we're trying to research at this point. Um, so let's turn to Europe. How, you, you, you're going to keep me honest on the time. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. show you the, my, yeah. my card. Okay, okay. So what happens in Europe? Now, Europe, um, uh, aggregated at the regional level, is doing fairly well. Um, you see the Europe 27 there at 55, compared to North America of 62, uh, Western Europe 59. We're in the zone relative to like where Europe should be in terms of development of digitization. But that's not very useful. The regional stuff masks so many differences that staying at this level would be building self-comfort about it. Um, here, we decouple the E27 in the different components of the, of, of the index or the metrics. And the, the, the tall blue line is affordability. And um, the lower green line is infrastructure, which measures investment. And here's where the thing starts getting interesting from a sort of like a policy strategy perspective. A, a, a pure strategist would look at this and say, okay, I'm going to put affordability aside because we, this is a complete. We figured that out, and look how high we are. It is not moving. This is like prices are, have come down. I mean, this is it for, for, for pricing. But where we have a problem is on investment. That is where, and where we have a problem is on usage. Um, usage, look, it's growing at only at 4% for the past seven years in the index. What we have a problem is on human capital. So I find it interesting because I have not heard about what was said about these issues before my presentation. There's quite of a coincidence between the conclusions of this and having done this unencumbered by, by, by the discussion in Brussels. But it says the, the high tent poles of strategy development as one would say it in the commercial world, are investment, usage, and human capital. That's it. And more importantly, when we teach strategy at school, we tell them that strategy is not only the things that you have to do, but the things that you don't have to do. Because coming up with a list of 100 things to do will make you lose focus. So clearly that gives you an ability to bring focus on the key imperatives that would enable you to meet that objective function of jobs and growth. Um, secondly, Europe is a tale of two geographies. Uh, and, and you can see here, now we develop uh, the indices for the different countries on the 27, and you see that you have advanced and you have some that are on the, on the um, transitional place. So again, coming up with a European sort of a, uh, European-wide message is not very useful for policy development because we have peop you know, countries, and I could say you can cut countries Within countries, you have the, the geographic segmentation that tells you that realities are quite different. Um, and that the, the imperatives, while common in terms of how low we score on infrastructure, the still the other issues are very important. And, and, and more importantly, you see how usage drops on transitional countries. So if one were to say usage, what we do with the technology is important. In transitional countries, it is very important. Because at these levels, these transitional countries are close to the emerging world. Um, so whatever happens on the, on the advanced ones has to spill over in some way, shape, or form to the others. Uh, the payback, uh, applying the, the, the formulas that you've seen before, has been so far good. I mean, $343 billion, uh, so, uh, this is, yeah, U.S. dollars, a ton of jobs on, on a year jobs, so digitization is paying off, but this is just the arithmetic of applying the equations that you saw before to the development of the index that you're seeing right now. So um, when you start looking at it on a, like a spider chart or radar chart, depending on how you want to call it, this is a picture for Europe as a whole. And this is the gap on infrastructure. This is how well we are on affordability and on the others. Uh, interestingly enough, I compare it with Norway. And look at the difference. Norway is the top. Norway is the top country that we found. And, and the difference, a big chunk of the difference, has to do with development of infrastructure. Uh, and then we say, well, where is this coming from, particularly on the usage side? And here we are, are, the, are, the, are the raw metrics, like what percentage of total retail commerce is going through the Internet? 
in Europe as a whole is 2%, 2.9. Uh, these are 2011 numbers because this is the latest that we have. Norway is a little higher. Look where the UK is, uh, really way ahead and close to sort of like the United States and where Greece is. So this gives you a little bit of the range of the problem that we are dealing with. Same thing with e-government index, same thing with percent of um, internet users in terms of the range, although the spread is not that high. Um, uh, this is the, the, the fourth one is the percentage of average revenue per user on wireless that is paid for in data services. And that gives you an indication of how much data is being conducted through each of our phones, how much are we accessing on applications. The range between Greece and, and Norway and the UK is, is, is quite revealing, and so on and so forth. So we have like a big spread here. We have a big challenge from a policy standpoint that we're not dealing with a, with a single geography. We're dealing with, I mean, in, in principle two, and then beyond two, with several geographically segmented within the differences that you might find between capitals and first-tier cities and second-tier cities, which is, by the way, the other uh, research area that we're focusing on. Um, here we're trying to take Europe to the level of Norway and the payback that, I would be, that that would mean in terms of uh, GDP impact, which is substantial. And, um, and I'll conclude with the elements of, of, of future agenda, really very uh, cursory because I believe that um, this is something that I didn't have time to work on. But um, when you look at it, is you've improved annually 5.16% in digitization over the past eight years. Affordability has barely improved, but I don't care about that because you were high already. Prices had dropped quite a bit. Uh, principal improvement areas have been international connectivity, and you know that because you know that the big pipes coming out of London and Amsterdam are good for all the internet traffic. You have, you're good on IXPs, uh, so you're very well there. Network access and you have penetration of devices, but the areas that remain uh, are infrastructure, investment, usage, and human capital. And those, I think, are the areas where policy has to focus on. Now, interestingly enough, I think that the problem that we have at a diagnostic level is one of inefficiencies, economic inefficiencies. And if you think about the digital sector going from production factors to the technology firms, and that, that includes the carriers and the internet firms and the app developers and all the startups, to the demand side, there are a bunch of inefficiencies. There's not liquidity, enough liquidity flowing to the uh, technology firms, both on the application side, there's not investment going on on the, on the network side, and there are problems on efficiencies in terms of matching what the demand needs and what the technology firms have to offer. I had similar figures about these uptake of networks. I mean, coverage of FTTH in Europe is in the order of roughly 11%. Well, uptake of that, at best, I mean, on, on the average is 20%. Now, the problem that wasn't mentioned about this 20% uptake is that no one makes money at 20%. The net present value of a fiber investment with 20% penetration is negative. So that says, well, at 20%, if I'm not making money, why should I be investing if I'm responsible to the shareholders? So w we have a big problem. <laughs> I think there is a big problem on these inefficiencies and, and, and how to tackle them. And that's obviously a longer discussion than the minute or half a minute that I have. To conclude, uh, we believe it, it has value. It's a global concept. It builds on these six pillars. It gives us a way of linking it back to uh, economic effects. And um, overall, what, what it enables us to have is now we have a diagnostic tool that would allow us to, while matching some of the conclusions of policymakers, actually starting, starting to zero in on some of the prescriptive areas on what is it that we need to do going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raul. Um, Fascinating presentation. I assure you get questions. Uh, I have myself questions and I self-censor my, myself. Uh, so in order to uh, please ask uh, short questions again because we are a bit constrained in time. Walter Lebs, uh, Technical University in Delft. Thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, conspicuous absent was Japan. Is there a reason? Because I'm always confused by their high investment and the, econo the economy doesn't seem to be benefiting. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and, and I can't give you like the precise answer. 
I thought that your question was oriented towards the policy side. Why is it that Korea sort of like leapfrogged and Japan was sort of like steady Freddy going and moving? But I think that there are some macroeconomic issues that have to be taken into consideration that probably our models wouldn't count for. In fact, what we found is whenever we try to apply this to a specific country, we have to start getting to the macroeconomic uh, variables like uh, oil prices. <laughs> yeah, oil prices was important. Uh, when we, whenever we apply it to the Gulf countries, we need to discount for that or control for oil prices and things like that. So I think in Japan, that would be one of the... And Raul, at the same time, in, uh, in Korea, 1995 is exactly the year where uh, most of the structural and, uh, and regulatory reforms take place. So that the, the country has made a big jump anyway in the mid-90s. Uh, yeah. And this m might explain yeah. this. Yeah. Chris? And then... Um, this is really, really interesting. And, and obviously the insight that if you, if you build a larger um, uh, database beyond just uh, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the demand side, you must be able to, to come up with a, a greater uh, multiplier. Must, must make sense. On the graph of Europe, there was a little bit of puzzlement for me, and I think probably for everyone in the audience. The UK was the second most advanced, and mm. Estonia was, I think, the second least advanced. Mm. And mm. I wonder if there's a link between that and what you said about the fact that, that this measures kind of the hard numbers rather than the actual overall social uh, and public welfare coming from, uh, from the internet. If the British are all spending their money on Ryanair and EasyJet fares and uh, internet porn and whatever else it is that we're spending our money in, in, in the, uh, the internet economy on, as well as spending a large amount of money on things like wireless data. I saw that the actual percentage of ARPU is one of the, the, the figures. Uh -huh. Would that explain things? Is it because the Estonians are, are getting stuff for free and are using the internet more creatively at a lower price? Yeah. And somehow that might account for the fact that th this very advanced economy finds itself sort of at the bottom of the ladder? I mean, one can always pick out individual examples, but yeah. that one struck a lot of us, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, th I, th I think it's a very um, important avenue to, to take a look at. I mean, there's definitely something about to say about the benefit of backwardness. That, that we definitely found, particularly working with some emerging countries. Some emerging countries are suddenly in the lapse of five years. Poof, they jump like big time. Constrained demand. Uh, Estonia would be also um, quite educated labor. Uh, or educated population, a bit, uh, you know, enabled to actually catch up uh, very rapidly with what to do with the machines once they have them in their hands and uh, things of that sort. But um, I, th I think that the country case studies would be useful to start calibrating some of these. You mean the, the Estonians are quicker in doing the things they need to do, but perhaps they <laughs> use less data. There's a question there and then the... In addition to the reverse causality, huh? that's the other thing. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas Garland. Um, it's an observation rather than a question. Um, I was interested, you, you said that the advanced countries, that effectively the digitalization development is, flat, is tailing off, because flattening out is one we'd expect yeah. as a mature cycle. We've heard from the other speakers that we say that should be, this is where we should put it, putting our investment for growth. That doesn't seem to match up. Good point. Good point. And we. Yeah. No. Precisely. And, and when we started seeing those numbers indicating some sort of a saturation effect, um, we wondered about that. And, and this is where our, conclu our discussion ended. That we still haven't pushed the envelope on the discussion on what to do with the technology. That in a way. The, there were two, two dimensions that we still hadn't had tackled. One, the accumulation of intangible capital, meaning that enterprises were able to get out of the technology everything that they could for tr transformational challenges and things of that sort. And then uh, another one that um, maybe we don't know what to do with that beyond uh, extrapolating the old world under the new technology as opposed to changing dramatically the rules of the game. And that, those were our conclusions hypothetically, and I think microeconomic analysis will only tell us where to go. We didn't like that result, obviously, because we were expecting, but um, that's the data. But you're absolutely right. I'm going to take uh, this question, and uh, you had Colin a question. There's two more questions, so please keep it short because we're already running late. Short question. 
Um, Alison Powell, um, I'm at the London School of Economics. Um, my question was about um, the relationship between greater uh, amounts of infrastructure investment and well-being, and whether there was anything that you had observed, although you said you hadn't really mm. worked on the well-being as yet. Mm. Um, I was curious about both Norway as a um, country with high infrastructure investment and also the United States, which you didn't actually quite like describe, but seemed to evoke as a sort of um, highly developed or effective or baseline somehow. Um, I wanted to know whether there were, A, any relationships between high levels of investment and well-being, and B, what, if there weren't, what, if anything, is significant about high levels of infrastructure investment? Yeah, yeah. Um, look, the, the analysis was very purely correlational in nature, but if you come up with a list of the controls rolling and doing well and broadband fair, uh, we would like to think that people in those two areas with their uh, high levels of specialization would be characterized as much better than smart we, we can't so far. Besides the other thing that we see is that there's a big problem also on employment, and I didn't mention this, but this employment, this job growth is very complex. The more you start digging, the more you start seeing that the aggregate numbers don't tell the story. Because on one hand, you have the spatial geography situation where uh, you have a donut theory where um, rural uh, peripheries and metropolitan areas, th this stuff helps metropolitan and peripheries. Rural doesn't benefit at all. Then you have the other cut by level of sophistication of the people. If, if, if people don't have a computer, no matter how much digitization they get, no, no more jobs. If they have a computer or they were accessing through dial-up and they had some level of literacy, then there was some impact. So um, I'm always very uh, uh, leery about coming up with a boom, an employment number because the, the impact that this is going to have at the micro level is very uh, uh, specific. And, and, and there the research is lagging big time the needs that the policy field needs because they are telling us, well, where do we focus? What do we do? What's the payback? And coming up with a single, if you raise 10%, you're going to get this, is really misleading and not helping the policy community. Thank you. I'm going to collect these two questions, although there was limit the amount of distance that Maria walks through. So I, I could we collect the two questions together and perhaps sure. you just sure. wrap up uh, quickly? Thank you. My name is Joost Poort. I work for the Institute for Information Law with the University of Amsterdam. Uh, it's a very inspiring uh, talk. Could you just say a few words about the composition of the index in terms of the weights that were attributed to the ingredients and whether you checked the various ingredients in their separate effect on things like GDP growth and employment, which are really the most important parts of it? Mm -hmm. uh, Colin? Colin Blackman, uh, editor of Info, and um, I think this is terrific stuff. I think we all, all love this enormously. Um, as a, po a policymaker, might conclude that this uh, gave a kind of green light to you know, much more investment and, and the sorts of things we've been hearing about. Um, you talk about broadband as being two megabits per second. Um, this data doesn't really support anything beyond saying that we should be investing in superfast broadband in terms mm. of the economic benefits of doing so. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Um, on, on, on your question, maybe I should address it on a side, and I'll show you a little bit of the um, work that we did for index validity and um, on the weight development, because it's more specific on the mechanics of it, but I'd be glad to show you some of the, the, the specifics of that, but we've done some of that work as well, the robustness assessment as well. On, on your issue, yeah, I mean, that's, well, Eric has done work on the return to speed, uh, and uh, there's the New Zealand work, thinks uh, there's a Scottish piece on dial-up to, to ADSL, but we are going a little bit blind, I would say. Beyond Eric's research, I, I, I know very little about return to speed so far on getting to 100, um, and, I, I, and I, it's hypo hypothesis, no, whether, we, we have an issue also of um, intangible capital, that uh, the SME gets 100 megabits, and then, well, okay, so how do I change my business processes? How do I recruit people? What kind of applications am I going to do? I mean, the things that I see in many cases, even in Europe, 
uh, obviously in emerging markets, is when you start doing case studies of these SMEs, well, they are using I ICT for um, finance, general ledger, and, uh, and payroll. And uh, okay, well, so 100 megabits won't help you a lot. <laughs> so you gotta do more stuff. And then there's this, and it takes time. This accumulation, uh, the, it takes like three to five years. So maybe some effects, we're gonna see them over time, but I think it's very relevant and it's a topic of concern as well. Thank you very much, Raul. You've got many questions. You addressed them very well. Uh, now, without further ado, I want to call Robin Mansell. Uh, thank you, Robin, for being also a bit patient. Uh, you offered to shorten a bit your speech. At some point, I was a bit more comfortable that you would not have to do this, but now I'm back falling on my knees asking you to at least keep, uh, keep uh, the time uh, because then uh, uh, there is a time where uh, the food for thought uh, leaves a room for thoughts about food or coffee and events and uh, we don't want to go past this threshold. Thank you very much for being with us today. So which threshold is it? When it approaches our belly. Okay. Um, First of all, let me use a couple of my very precious minutes to say that as um, chair of the scientific committee of uh, EuroCPR, I want to welcome all of you here. And then I want to apologize for making you sit through four keynotes. Um, and I'm wondering, while I'm talking, would you like to sort of wave your arms in the air and wake yourselves up, <laughs> stretch a little? Because I know it's a very long time to be sitting there. Um, I'd also like to thank our um, organizing committee, without whom we wouldn't be here, and particularly Karen Donders and Caroline Powells. Karen's gone out, but Caroline's back there. Um, to thank them for making sure that this all happens, and to thank Andrea for ho hosting us here. So uh, now I'm into my negative time. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is talk not so much about an assessment of policy in quantitative terms, but um, look at the question as to how far have we come over recent times in the last decade in um, building accountability into digital agenda type uh, policies and regulatory measures. I know that the digital agenda came in 2010, but we've been talking about broadband and these kinds of issues for a very long time. And in addition, in my talk, I want to ask the question whether there are signs in the kinds of policies and practices that we're talking about of a serious effort to consider citizens' interests alongside those of market players. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail about what the digital agenda is. We've heard much about that uh, so far. Um, and I thought I'd start by talking about a few echoes of the past in today's discussion. Then I'm going to zero in on two cases, one being interconnection policy and the other being the broadband investment issue. To, to think about the negotiations and just exactly what interests are at stake. Um, way back when, in the 1990s, in 1996, I posed the question, will the 21st century see the withering away of regulation, or will it see the role of public policy and regulation strengthened to pr protect citizens' interests? Um, so what happened in the succeeding years, we've seen alongside the waves of innovation in digital technologies. In networks, a really strong emphasis up until recently on light touch regulation with some enforcement of access obligations uh, where significant mar market power is seen to exist. So a lot of the emphasis has been on network signals on congestion and controls. In the content area, we've seen a lot of emphasis on stimulating competition to to boost the creative industries um, in member states of Europe um, and the introduction of public value tests to in many cases to justify public service broadcasting. And in the internet area, um, basically the end-to-end -end architecture of the internet was accepted as basically a neutral conduit. Uh, for the most part, there's been assumed that there was no controls, no bottlenecks, no metered prices, and no need for regulation hence the net network neutrality argument. Um, <clears throat> and in that period, basically thinking back a decade, what was one of the most central concerns? Well, it really was whether the PSDN or plain old telephone service um, was going to be adequate to meet the needs 
of basically citizens and businesses, or whether, as Ellie Noam once put it, we would see a spin-off of a separate, the bottom part of that diagram, a private network effectively, one that was invested according to, d in, according to different rules. Um, the whole lease lines debate um, was a very big debate in the 1990s. And the question was, would you have a slow lane and a fast lane? And what exactly were the policies being put in place? So far today, we've been talking about pipes as if one pipe is the same as another pipe. Um, this debate 10, 20 years ago was about the possible bifurcation of networks, a public network for some and a private network, very efficient perhaps, very advanced for those who could afford it. Um, in recent times, flipping to the present, there's been quite a lot of authors in both the United States but also in Europe who've been asking, have we got a set of new control points in the development, the evolution of the internet? Are we having the development of public internet for some and a managed services internet for others? We've had uh, particularly uh, Norin and Van Eyck, well, the latter of whom I don't think he's here today, but he's a longtime CPR um, participant, um, have talked about policy promoting neutrality and openness of the public internet which makes managed services more attractive for the content delivery networks, which are becoming more of a fast lane. Um, Ian Brown and Chris, in their recent book, pointed to the uh, fact that by some estimates, the private intranets may be 10 times larger than the public internet. Yet most of the policy, most of the discussion we're having is really all about that public internet. So if the public internet today is the equivalent of yesterday's um, PSDN, a question is, remember we're thinking about the citizen's interest here, might the public internet become the equivalent of a, a country lane while the rest of the fast lane takes off? In other words, does the ICT sector become more and more disconnected from the rest of the economy, which is effectively the question we were just addressing. Now in the US debate, um, people like Sidak and Thies say that they think this is unlikely and that in any intervention from policy and regulation would um, stifle Schumpeterian innovation, and so, again, hands off. Do not intervene in the development of either infrastructure or the services. Um, they are skeptics, but there are others who say, actually, there is a need to do something about this possible divergence between the public internet and the private internet. So um, this is a, a diagram borrowed from uh, Nora Net Al's uh, article that was just published in Info um, in 2013, and look at the similarity of what is happening. The earlier diagram, the PSTN versus lease lines. Here we have the public internet lane and a managed services lane, which are developing arguably along two tracks. So the question I'm asking you to think about is whether our policy is so homogeneous that it doesn't actually recognize those potentials um, for divergence. Um, I wanted to use an example of why this is of concern, drawing on the interconnection issue, and I'm not going to get into all of um, great, deal, great detail about internet peering and transit. But when we think about the interests, some would say, like you in Sutherland, that big business is quite happy the way things are, um, more or less. I mean, they certainly lobby for greater investment, but Basically, the current policy and regulatory environment for them is reasonably conducive. It's not hugely competitive, but it is attractive because it allows them to um, negotiate the kinds of uh, service packages quite often in the fast lane. Um, the ISP view it is quite often um, that yes, there are issues to do with interconnection and how the money flows through the networks, but they don't have any competence to deal with what citizens are quite concerned about, which is fundamental human rights, diversity of content, etc. cetera. Um, there's some academic work in the legal field um, where the observation is applied to Europe that actually what we're doing is we're moving away from the old end-to-end -end neutral network on a slippery slope to somewhere. And the question is, in whose interest is that slide down a slippery slope? 
Um, <clears throat> in the U.S. and in Europe, um, one conclusion about this debate in the U.S., which I acknowledge is a completely differently structured market, is that the interconnection agreements among the content industry, the ISPs and the content industry, they don't just route traffic through the internet. They're not just a technical set of issues. They also route money. And what is the conclusion? There is very limited publicly verifiable data available on what's going on in those interconnection markets. Um, we might say, well, in Europe we have better data. Um, Jonathan Liebenau, who's in the uh, management department at LSE, just concluded that we don't have publicly verifiable data in Europe either. And yet, arguably, this is one of the most vital parts of the way in which the slow and the fast lanes develop. On the EU digital agenda to-do list, and we've heard just uh, a, a little bit about some aspects of that, uh, one of the points, certainly by no means all of them, is to create a new stable broadband regulatory environment. How to do that? One of the issues is to develop new costing me methodologies and new ways of understanding what is going on in the interconnect market. So again, what I'm asking to think about is just how transparent will that be and where will the debates be in terms of whose interests are being reflected. A lot of this has to do with negotiating power and the transparency and the way these in, um, discussions take place, just as it has always done historically. What are the concerns about ISP traffic management practices? Um, well, there are struggles over these two lanes. Um, on the one hand, access to networks and bandwidth, content, ownership rights, the use of packet and deep packet inspection for profiling, and smart billing raise all sorts of economic issues about efficiency, but they also raise issues about privacy, about security, about freedom of expression, and about plurality and diversity of content issues, quite often not discussed in the same room together. Economic analysis of interconnection issues spills over into fundamental rights issues. And one can see that very much when one looks, for example, at the European Convention on Human Rights, the famous Internet Freedom Clause in the last telecom reform package, which was so controversial. So is it an issue? Well, if you look at the most recent Ofcom report on interconnection and whether or not there are issues to do with peering and transit in that market, they say some mobile service um, operators are blocking some services, raising potentially fundamental rights issues. Um, they say this is a concern, but our current view is that competition among the operators should be an effective means of addressing it, as long as consumers are made aware of what's happening. In other words, can you go online, poke, and find out if you're getting a fast or a slow line as what as is advertised? Um, am I going fast enough? <laughs> um, so, officially, the regulators do not see this issue of fast lane, slow lane, and the money flowing through the, inter, um, the interconnection um, arrangements as being a big issue in Europe as yet. But again, do we have enough transparency and data available to actually make that assessment independently? Um, Basically what one could argue, and I have argued in my most recent book, which I called the Imagining the Internet, is that in this particular area where traffic flowing through networks is money through flowing through networks, so it has interest attached to it, is we once upon a time had an internet where rationing bursty intense demand was what operators were doing. They had always been doing that on the PSTN. They are doing it now in the internet environment as would any wise operator, ISP, would start choosing priorities among traffic types if you meet congestion problems or have issues of balancing the interests and demand from the big businesses and the consumers or citizens. We are also beginning to see the introduction of more filtering online. Remember, most people talk about it as being end-to-end -end and neutral, but we are seeing the beginning of more fil filtering to produce benefits and we smile if we think it's anti-spam and anti-virus protection, but we get a little bit worried about civil liberties and fundamental rights when we think it might be anti-pornographic or indeed in some countries outside Europe of a signal of suppression of political expression. I've drawn a red line there because probably right now we're 
I would say, about there in that hierarchy. And the question, it seems to me, when I'm raising issues about the transparency and accountability of policy and regulation in this area, is whether we continue to go down the path to four and five. That is effectively when we start seeing a real potential divergence between the public internet and the managed services world. Whether we go eventually to full-blown auctioning of priority traffic. It's a possibility. I imagine many of you would be saying, no, 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 we don't want to go there because it has implications for the types of networking that's available to both business and citizens. Let me turn quickly then to issues of negotiating power around this whole business of broadband in infrastructure. Um, so far, th the panelists, the other keynote speakers have talked and referred a lot to building out broadband ne next generation um, access. And we know that much of the funding, wa funding was cut for the Connecting Europe facility just recently. But let's assume that there is some funding slushing away <laughs> somewhere. Um, what are some of the issues when it comes to thinking about in whose interest is this being developed? Um, in the uh, investment strategy, there is talk of white spots, which are those spots which have not got connectivity, and black spots where it may be the case that you need to uh, publicly invest in next generation access networks. But the, the issue about accountability and about information in the public domain becomes evaluating what is a concrete plan when cities and municipalities come along and say, we want to invest public money in, next gen in any kind of network, broadband, if the incumbent says, we have a con concrete plan to invest in the next three years, on what basis do you investigate that information? What becomes a step change in um, the type of network access that is available in a particular area as compared to now or 10 years in the future? We imagine that 100 megabytes will be enough, but what if we get five years down the line and it starts being 300? <laughs> In other words, technological innovation isn't going to stop and wait for policy. Um, transparent costing of methodologies for wholesale access. If you think back a couple of decades, both in Europe and in North America, the enormous politi politicization <laughs> of whether one does long run incremental costing or whether one does fully distributed costing, and all those debates fundamentally have to do with how one assesses who's going to make money in various kinds of peering and transit arrangements and configurations in the networks of Europe. Um, as all of this takes place, some people, long-time observers, like Richard Colley, for example, who used to work in the Commission, says, the new PSTN public internet policy seems to be had heading in the direction of a designated monopoly infrastructure model for some countries and for some regions. Now that might be something of an over overstatement, but it does suggest that one view of policy is to come full circle, if you like, away from the light touch regulation of the last couple of decades and back to a different form of intervention, but pretty heavy in terms of public subsidies and investment. Bill Melody has kind of looked around Europe and said competition is stalling and may be in retreat in the fixed broadband and mobile networks. His observation is that the scope of national regulatory agencies' independence is reducing and that commitment, the commitment really is to universal broadband uh, services through subsidies. Is this really in the interest of the consumer or is this really in the interest of the fast lane um, networks? Um, is it in the interest of muni municipalities and community uh, responses? I think it was mentioned earlier that the UK has its own distinct way of doing this. Um, but uh, I just take three very quick examples. Birmingham City Council passed all the tests for the subsidized investment in um, a super fast network being evaluated by the commission, the costs that it put forward and the uh, future projected revenues were approved. It was going to be an area where we can build out publicly subsidized super fast networks. And what did BT come along and say, and Virgin, immediately after this was decided, we don't believe the data. 
the European Commission has made a decision based on inaccurate and misleading information which could waste public money. The question I'm putting to you is, especially in our role as independent academics, we can't ever see that information. If we went online, we couldn't even see aggregated information to do an independent assessment. So we have clashing interests. Will that network get built in the, sh in the next couple of years? Well, maybe. Another uh, example completely outside that framework in some ways is called BARN, or and is how they pronounce it. It's a Lancashire farmers optical fiber network being based on investment by farmer shareholders. It harkens back to the days of building the PSTN many years ago, particularly in North America and in some countries outside Europe, where it was cooperatives and coalitions who came together to build the network. Interesting model, but is that really being supported by current EU policy in the most effective way? Another model is being developed through community shares or shareholders in Cumbria. It's an old mining village. Um, this is serious industrial uh, policy. They're building an optical fiber network built on community shares. There's a lot of these community-based initiatives happening in North America. I think there's some in Latin America that I've come across. And so in Europe, are we doing enough to really enable communities to express their demand? Not for somebody to come from the supply side and say you need speeds of this and that and the other thing, but for them to come along and say, this is what we need, and we're prepared to invest in it. So, in conclusion, coffee is a moment away. Um, <laughs> what do I, my overall assessment, looking back to the mid-1990s and looking forward to now, I would say we have not progressed very far in terms of the accountability side of things in terms of eliciting data which can be independently ins assessed which isn't driven by the hype or from the ICT industry itself, the lobby saying you must do it, and is not driven by um, hopeful statistics, which no one can verify because no one really has a crystal glass about what the productivity gains will be from next generation investment. Um, policymakers championing uh, citizens' interests have actually an observation, few intersections with the ICT lobby and broadband champions, by which I mean that the community of people who are most concerned about fundamental rights is over here, and the community of people who are most concerned about building broadband and interconnect is over there. Um, the results could be, unless we are able to get more verifiable empirical information into the public domain, could be a two-lane multi-tier network. Could be. Might not be, but it could be. Um, it would seem that unless we have more verifiable information, we, policy will have less and less traction on influencing the corporate behavior. <laughs> they will set the terms and conditions of their interconnection arrangements in a way which is um, conducive, as they should, to their business interests. The, a lack of public um, information and transparency seems to be um, endemic, and I don't point the finger at Europe in this. I think this is a real problem in all areas, it was in telecommunications historically, and now, although we used to think we had a nice neutral internet, it's becoming more of a problem in the new networking environment because it is no longer a completely open and neutral network. It's a non-neutral network on a slippery slope. Um, it could be said that we in Europe are building broadband pipes for the large content providers and delivery networks of which most of them or many of them are not European in origin, something that's been said before, but if it's true now again, should we not be addressing that? So my overall message, and I finish with this, it is essential to independently assess whether claims made for European policies and the national implementation strategies, not just the overall aggregate, are empty promises in the sense that they are de not delivered because of oppositional strategies, or whether they are really credible approximations that influence what is actually happening. And here I would think that paying more attention to the kinds of metrics that Raul is, is producing, but looking at them more systematically and comparing them with real investment trajectories, not promises, but actual practice, would be a good way forward, and maybe CPR academics can help in that. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Robin. I'm going to take two questions, and the rest uh, can be addressed uh, also with Robin during the coffee break, I'm sure. Uh, so I have uh, Chris and Bert, uh, I think. Uh, they've been the quickest ones, the reflexes. So, just quickest very quickly, I mean, fascinating agenda. I mean, it's such a broad agenda that I don't want to, to try to, to ask a question about everything, but just to pick up on one issue. The issue about uh, managed services on the Internet uh, has become such a, a complex technical and economic as well as legal issue. Uh, talking to the members of the FCC's Open Internet Advisory uh, Committee, which has four subgroups, one of which is specifically about managed services, um, they said that actually at the moment they're finding it almost impossible to try to define what a managed service is, because if you look at DOCSIS 3, for instance, it's actually virtual tunneling. So there's, it's actually a very, very difficult thing to actually analyze. Mm -hmm. and one of the members of the, of the advisory committee, uh, Alyssa Cooper, is actually going to be speaking in Brussels in a couple of weeks' time about some of the outcomes of their, their discussions there. So, so yes, I, I, I share, well, actually, I, I don't entirely share your fears about that, because as you know, I'm, I'm somebody who advocates uh, FRAND-based um, uh, offers on the managed uh, 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 service lane, um, which admittedly is some kind of regulation, but it's a fairly minimal type of regulation. I'm a I'm probably a bit of a backslider in that. Um, but actually just defining the issue set here is so extraordinarily difficult for anybody except those people inside the companies. And I'm reminded of what the accounting director of, of British Telecom said in the middle of the local loop unbundling saga in the UK uh, when he said to Oftel, you can't possibly tell what my costs are and you can't possibly tell what the behaviours are of our engineers because we don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> Bertsadowski. Just uh, Bertsadowski, University of Eindhoven. Uh, I just one remark and maybe one, uh, or maybe two remarks actually. One remark is that actually we have in Europe we don't have any data on the zip code levels, for example, in the, in the way, for example, in the US, this data is available, <coughs> so you actually could make some assessment about the local level. I mean, if you say we have some, some uh, black spots, we have some white spots, and if you do, for example, some municipal investment, we actually do not know if this is a success or not because we can't evaluate that, right? And therefore, I mean, the state is not available. In Europe, it's most of the time it's somewhere in the, in the private sphere. I mean, you can generate it if you want to, but it is not like in the US, you have this broadband map where you can actually see on the postcode level where you can, I mean, generate, for example, certain effects, right? That's one point about the, the, the data. And the second thing is, the whole discussion until now, I think, was very much focused on the telecom industry itself, right? Dominant firms, that's what we have in, in the industry in Europe. And basically, I think what they do most of the time also that they are very much focused on themselves. And I think what the real impact in the future could be is coming from other industries. Right, that we actually have to open up the sector in terms of, I mean, that health health insurance companies come in and actually provide some benefits. Health uh, service companies come in and some, uh, provide some benefits and services. And this is actually the real new, I mean, uh, uh, push in terms of innovation. And the problem is, if we keep keeps that closed, then we don't will have this kind of benefits in the future. And this is actually where it comes from, not so much on the sector itself, that we actually. What we see is a sectoral transformation, not so much something which is on the level of the, of the, uh, yeah, on the telecom industry itself. Thanks. Just two comments. Yes. Uh, very quickly, on, on Chris's point about technical detail, I think it has been said since, since time immemorial that um, to both that technical expert, non-technical experts cannot understand what the issues are that are at stake in terms of telecom methodologies for costing, et cetera, and that the companies do not know their own costs. In other words, they operate without regard to costs. This has been said and been said and been said, but it doesn't change the situation that some kinds of information can indeed be made available and that it is possible to have informed negotiation and dialogue, not least because policymakers are not all cost engineers or cost accountants. So, I mean, it, policymakers are going to be making judgments. I'm talking about the possibility of independent judgment not related to industry interests. That's all not a nirvana world where everybody becomes a detailed uh, cost accountant. <laughs> um, on the issue of uh, data, 
I don't disagree with you at all. I was using these as cases to show where it is in very important areas which will make a difference to how the infrastructure evolves and what services are that can use that infrastructure, um, where there are some dilemmas, and they're not much talked about, quite often left aside, and, oh, they'll take care of themselves while we worry about the bigger issues. Um, and I, again, I was choosing to look at the supply side and not the demand side because I can't talk about everything in 20 minutes. So I don't disagree with you there either. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. And uh, with a little bit of delay, of course, but uh, we've come to, come to a close. Uh, it will be now time for coffee, and I would like to uh, thank again the four presenters, the four keynote speakers of this session. Uh, Megan, Jorgen, Raoul, and Robin, I think you, you did a fantastic job with your presentation and have set the stage for uh, the upcoming sessions, although they'll be a bit more constrained in time, but they will have a uh, you know, perfect knowledge base on which to uh, build up with a more strict moderator, which will be Jean-Paul, after the coffee section. Uh -huh. you, yeah, you have a, uh, an announcement. Let them know. And we need here that the third practical uh, method for those that want to join together with us in the practical. We need here at the fourth and fast method to ask for uh, information about uh, that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. No, 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 no,